and the honourable members for Swansea East, Inverclyde and Sheffield Central, and from the other place. The proposals encapsulated in our blueprint draw on that knowledge and combine it with the best available evidence and insights in the 16,000 submissions we received in response to our call for evidence. That is what this white paper will deliver, with proposals for reform that cover six key areas, proposals that build on our strong track record of acting in punters' interests with existing measures, like cutting stakes on fixed odds betting terminals in 2019, banning credit card gambling in 2020, reforming online VIP schemes in 2020, introducing new limits to make online slots safer in 2021, upgrading rules on identifying and intervening to protect people showing signs of harm in 2022. Firstly, we want to tackle some of the challenges unique to online gambling. Campaigners have expressed to me the one thing that differentiates problem gambling from so many other forms of addiction is that it can often take place in secret. So we are going to force companies to step up their checks on when losses are likely to be unaffordable or harmful for punters. Companies already have to intervene when they know a customer is spending vast sums. But this change will better protect those least able to afford even small losses. And on top of the checks, we plan to bring in online slot games more in line with bricks and mortars equivalents, with a state limit on online slots of between £2 and £15, subject to consultation. Secondly, we know many addicts find each time they break free from the temptation to gamble, they are drawn back into the orbit of online companies with the offer of a free bet or some free spins. So to help stop problem gamblers being bombarded, the Gambling Commission has beefed up its rules on online VIP schemes, already resulting in a 90% reduction in these schemes, and it will now consult on making sure bonus offers are not being deployed in ways which only exacerbate harm. And that brings me to the third area, which is our regulator. We can all agree that we need a robust, data-savvy and proactive regulator which can stand up to the giant companies it regulates. So my department will make sure the Gambling Commission has the appropriate resources to support this work and deliver the commitments across the White Paper. No one should be denied an innocent flutter, but the public should not have to bear the cost of treatment when a punter becomes an addict. So one of the important changes it will introduce, and one backed by both campaigners and many in this House, will be a new statutory levy to turn the tables on problem gambling, one that sees gambling companies required to fund more groundbreaking research education and treatment. The fourth element is about redressing the power imbalance between punters and gambling companies when things go wrong. Those people who, do not, who find themselves having lost out due to operator failure. So we're going to work with industry and the Gambling Commission to create a non-statutory ombudsman that gives customers a single point of contact. The fifth part is one that I know unites this whole house, which is doing more to protect children. Gambling is an adult activity, and it must remain an adult activity. That is a major reason why I applauded the decision taken by the Premier League to remove gambling sponsorships from their shirts, from their shirts fronts in coming seasons. And it's the same reason we are ensuring children can do no forms of gambling, either online or on widely accessible scratch cards. Finally, we know the current status quo disadvantages casinos, bingo halls and other traditional premises compared to their online equivalents. A number of assumptions which prevailed at the time of the 2005 Act now look increasingly outdated. So we plan to rebalance regulation and remove restrictions which disadvantage the land-based sector. Madam Deputy Speaker, almost every Member of Parliament will have met constituents whose lives have been blighted by gambling. Gambling harm, that is, the online world has transformed so many parts of life, and gambling is no exception. It is our responsibility to make sure our rules and regulations keep up with the real world, so we can protect the most vulnerable, whilst also allowing everyone else to enjoy gambling without harm. I look forward to working with every member of this House to bring forward 
are gambling rules into the digital age. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Shadow Minister Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I also thank the Secretary of State for this update and for advance sight of her statement. I too would like to pay tribute to all of those campaigners who have long been calling for better reform and regulation of the gambling industry. The Shadow Secretary of State had given her apologies for today, a long before we knew of this statement, so I'd like to let the House know that today. But Madam Deputy Speaker, what we all know to be true is that updated gambling regulation is long overdue. The last legislation on the statute books is from 2005, long before the huge rise and growth in online and mobile gambling opportunities. As a consequence, people have also ha now have the ability to gamble constantly and make huge losses in a very short space of time. I have met with many people whose lives and whose families' lives have been devastated by gambling harm. It is because of them that this House comes together cross-party to call for better regulation of gambling. Anyone can fall into gambling addiction, so we need a modernised, robust system which is fit for the future. From bingo to the races, some forms of gambling are, of course, a traditional British pastime. Around half of adults participate in some form of gambling, and the vast majority do so with enjoyment and in moderation. Indeed, as an example, bingo halls are an important part of sustaining our local communities, especially in coastal and rural towns. And let us be clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, bingo halls and adult gaming centres and casinos are facing their own pressures in terms of skyrocketing energy bills and concerns about the sustainability of their business models in the face of significant online competition. It is therefore welcome that there is distinction in the announcement between bricks and mortar bingo halls and low-stick adult gaming centres with the dangers that are unique to the online world. But I must push the Secretary of State further here. Although we have waited a long time for this statement, it is very light in substance. So can she confirm exactly how land-based and online gambling forums will differ in terms of their levy contributions? This is an important point, and I urge the Minister to clarify, both for the industry and for the 110,000 people employed in, um, in the industry. What has the economic impact assessment been with regards to the Treasury for this announcement? The government has delayed this white paper many times. Everything they're announcing today was ready to go a year ago. Six gambling ministers, four culture secretaries have all promised to publish this white paper imminently. That being said, Madam Deputy Speaker, we welcome many of the measures in the announcement, which are many of the things we've long been calling for, and it is a move in the right direction. She mentioned the Premier League's voluntary ban on gambling adverts on the front of shirts. However, this really is quite weak. The voluntary ban, as it stands, does not cover hoardings or even the sides or back of shirts. It also will not come into effect for three years. So, in that time, what is to stop the Premier League from reverting on their voluntary ban once public attention has moved on? Will the Minister be pressing the Premier League to go further? I have some further questions about today's announcement, which I must press. Firstly, as I said, we welcome the levy, but can she tell us exactly what this levy will be? In addition, Labour welcomes the new powers for the Gambling Commission, but the Minister must confirm if they will get extra resource to match this additional responsibility. The Gambling Commission have already been found by the NAO to have insufficient capacity to regulate the industry, and now they'll have further things to regulate. So is the Shadow Secretary confident they will have capacity for the expanded role they'll take on? In terms of affordability checks, we know that further sharing between gambling companies is badly needed, and I await details of the checks in the consultation. However, it is vital that affordability checks are set independently from the industry. So can the Secretary of State provide us reassurance on this? That brings me to my next point. The Minister makes reference to stake limits and safer by design mechanisms, which of course we welcome. But will they be based on how dangerous a product is? Who will decide that? It took years and the resignation of a minister to get stake limits on fixed odds betting terminals. So can she reassure the House that these limits will have teeth and reduce harm from day one? Finally, it is clear that we need greater protections for children and under 18s. So will these measures cover stronger action on loot boxes and other in-game features that are proven to lead young people to be more likely to experience gambling, mental health, financial and problem gambling related harms? Madam Deputy Speaker, Labour has been clear that we stand ready to work with the government. We have been ready to stand for a long time to tackle problem and harmful gambling, and we have repeatedly called for updates and to this completely outdated legislation. The government has a real opportunity here to do the right thing, to make positive, real-world change for the better. The Secretary of State must commit to getting these updates over the line in good time. The time for more and more consultation has been and gone. So can the Secretary of State confirm and commit to passing all of these necessary statutory instruments before the House rises over the summer? She must crack on and make good on these long overdue promises. I look forward to further clarification from the Minister over the points I have raised and to ultimately work together to tackle gambling at its root. 
Secretary of State. Uh, well, uh, I, th I thank the Shadow Minister for her comments, and the uh, Shadow Secretary of State also made her apologies to me, so I'm very grateful uh, for and understand the reasons for her absence. Uh, I'm pleased that she said that we need to update the rules, and this measure would have cross-party uh, support. I very much look forward to working with the Shadow Front Bench on something that is uh, so important. Uh, she mentioned the delay, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, but, and I would like to reiterate a, a number of things. One is, of course, the measures that we have taken uh, over the past few years, which I mentioned uh, in my speech, whether that's cutting states on fixed odds, betting terminals, banning credit card gambling, reforming online VIP schemes or introducing new limits to make online slots safer. Uh, she will know that I have been in post only two and a half months. Uh, this has been a priority for me. Uh, I have brought it in, I would say, uh, with some speed, uh, and that speed uh, and timeliness, I think uh, she can be confident, will continue to ensure that these measures uh, make it forward into the necessary regulations. We're bringing many of these measures through uh, by statutory instruments which will speed up the process. And I very much look forward to uh, the Shadow Bench cooperation to ensure that we can bring these forward, uh, these measures as soon as possible. Damien Green. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I congratulate my right honourable friend for finally, finally uh, getting this white paper uh, published. And I particularly welcome the introduction of the statutory levy, which she will know has got great support on all parts of the House. Uh, the most disturbing fact uh, I've learned in preparing for the Select Committee's upcoming investigation into gambling is that at this moment there are something like 50,000 children who are problem gamblers in this country. That is a truly shocking figure. So could my right honourable friend expand more on the really essential measures uh, in her proposals that will protect children from this terrible scourge? Uh, well, uh, my right honourable friend makes some very important points, and I think across this House we do want to ensure that uh, we protect children. And that's why, uh, in addition to measures that are already in place, ensuring, for example, targeting of advertising does not place, take place towards children, uh, there are a, a number of measures, including the ban. Uh, the voluntary ban that's taking place on uh, football shirts, but not just that. Uh, as I mentioned, we are ensuring that gambling is illegal uh, when it deals with uh, monetary gambling up until uh, the age of 18. So we will be uh, making it illegal for children to take part in scratch cards or um, uh, <coughs> slots that uh, uh, produce uh, cash. Uh, and of course, the statutory levy that he raises is so important because it is through the statutory levy that we can continue to look at research on how gambling affects children and can take uh, any uh, necessary measures in due course. SNP spokesperson John Nicholson. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy uh, Speaker. And can I thank the Secretary of State for advanced uh, sight of her statement? Um, we have consistently encouraged and pressed the government for action in this area, and as other honourable and right honourable members have said, a dozen ministers responsible for gambling have come and gone since change was first promised. Clearly, the 2005 Act is out of date and grows ever more relevant to modern gambling realities by the day. Those vulnerable to harm, especially children, are not well protected under the current legislation. Uh, my party, these benches and I will approach this important discussion with constructive dialogue to support evidence-led legislation from the outset. Uh, perhaps the Secretary of State can outline the role, the precise role of the Ombudsman, especially when it comes to protecting children, because I know members on all sides are deeply concerned with the huge rise in gambling amongst children. Uh, we will uh, work constructively with the government. We know that gambling destroys lives. I would like to pay tribute to so many charity workers and others who have pressed for these changes, and members across the House, on my benches in particular, the Hon. Member for Inverclyde, who has worked tirelessly on this. We will work constructively with the government in assessing what the right way forward is that protects the vulnerable from harm. Thank you. 
Uh, well, I'm very grateful for that constructive approach. I very much look forward uh, to working with him um, on the measures uh, as, they, as they progress. He mentions the non-statutory ombudsman. That is an important measure to ensure uh, that we redress the balance uh, between punters who feel that uh, uh, they, their issues have not been addressed sufficiently and uh, the companies involved. And that's why we're bringing forward a, a, a non-statutory ombudsman uh, on which we will be consulting in due course. Sir Ian Duncan-Smith. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful. Can I first of all say to my vulnerable friend, I welcome uh, what she has announced there. I particularly want to pay tribute to uh, those on the all-party parliamentary group, the leadership of the member for Inverclyde and for Swansea East, uh, particularly a lady for Swansea East, who has, uh, with us, uh, driven this uh, like an uh, in- unstoppable power and a force of nature, so I pay particular tribute to her. Can I just say that uh, I welcome this, Madam Deputy Speaker, because this is at least a start. I think it's a positive start. I think most of the recommendations made by the all-party group are in here, and I welcome that as well. But there are a, cu- a couple of areas. One is to recognise this is about online harms, and the, the most harm that's being caused is from the online companies. Uh, physical betting shops, etc., are not part of that process, and I think, therefore, when she looks at those land-based areas, she'll recognise when it comes to the levy, the statutory levy, the majority of that should be borne by those who are doing online harm, um, and, uh, and that is important. The second thing is on advertising and children. I simply want to say to her, not far enough. I don't mean to be churlish about this, because I welcome it, but I do say this uh, voluntary position uh, by companies uh, uh, to have uh, uh, advertising off their shirts. Children, I'm a season ticket holder for Tottenham, they don't have a betting company in it, but many do, and children wear these things, and they go to school sometimes in them, and they advertise, therefore, these gambling companies on their shirts. So we need to recognise this is a permanent process, even if they move it to the arms, uh, the point being made, it may, who knows, in two years, they'll slowly creep from the arms to the front. So I would say, when you consult on this, come back with a decision that actually we need to take control of this. But I welcome this, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a step for security and safety and common sense, and that has to be welcomed by the House. Uh, well, I'd like to begin by commending uh, my right honourable friend for all the work uh, that he and others have done in this area. And it's because of uh, the points that they have made in their tireless campaigning, along with those who have suffered harms themselves you know, and their families. It is the result of all that work uh, that we are standing here today able to bring forward uh, this white paper. Um, he, he particularly mentions young people, and I share his concern. We must do more, which is why we are taking steps to make gambling illegal in so many other forms uh, for people who are under 18. And I, I do welcome the Premier League's announcement in relation to front of shirts uh, being banned, uh, because uh, footballers are role models for our children. Uh, and we don't want to have young people going around uh, advertising gambling on the front of their shirts. They like to wear their football shirts. So I welcome uh, that voluntary move that's been taken by the Premier League, which uh, I know uh, me and uh, predecessors uh, have encouraged the Premier League to take. Of course, we will look carefully at evidence and uh, uh, that comes forward with, any, uh, with, the, with the funding from the statutory levy um, and keep all these matters under review. Kevin Brennan. I thank Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Secretary of State for her, her statement and just managed to get a copy of the, the white paper. It was widely reported that um, there might be restrictions on over 18s introduced as part of the white paper, but looking at the white paper, it, it appears that it's more a, a, a commitment to um, consult on uh, asking gambling companies to think 25 <coughs> rather than to think 21 when, when going about age verification. Given the real issue we're trying to deal with is children gambling, could you just explain what the thinking is behind that particular provision? Uh, well, uh, the Honourable Member is right to point out that um, w- it is appropriate to also protect people who are over 18 um, and perhaps under 25. And uh, when he manages to read the whole of the white paper, I hope he will see our, our, our proposals in relation to online slots. Uh, where there uh, will be a consultation on a, on a, on a, a smaller uh, amount of money that could be bet by, ch- by young adults uh, between 18 and 25. Damien Collins. Uh, thank you. Um, I congratulate the Secretary of State and the officials in her department on the work in producing this review. Does she agree, I agree with her that the 
oh, Gambling Commission needs to be a data savvy regulator. Can she confirm that they will be able to run independently the background affordability checks in, without causing friction in the system? But also importantly, I think the, the rules that run the gathering of data and the use of data to target advertising and to power and to drive customers towards loot boxes. A lot of those industry rules are really written for the pre-smartphone world, and the Gambling Commission needs to make sure that vulnerable players are not being data profiled and targeted. Uh, as always, uh, my honourable friend makes some uh, very important points, and I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to discuss uh, these issues with him, given his expertise and knowledge in this area. He mentioned the player protection checks. Uh, those will largely be background checks that uh, will be seamless and frictionless tech checks uh, that will take place, uh, only affect 20% of people, and, and, and most of them will not know that anything is taking place, but are really important to ensure that gambling companies take their responsibilities seriously to check what is happening, as I said, in secret. He also mentions loot boxes. He will know that the, the government uh, is... Uh, is working with companies and pressing them to ensure that there are protections there as well. Uh, Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. As chair of the Gambling Related Harm APPG, I welcome this long overdue what white paper. In the APPG's 2019 interim report, we asked for <coughs> affordability checks, parity with land and online stakes, an independent ombudsman, a curb on advertising, and most importantly, a statutory levy. Job done. The APPG also pushed against strong backlash from the industry for all of the reforms that the Secretary of State mentioned earlier, not least FOBTs, measures on VIPs and credit cards. But today is progress. It may have taken eight years of campaigning, nine culture secretaries and ten changes in hair colour, but it's progress nonetheless. Today is a momentous occasion that many thought and many wished would never happen. But now the commitments need to be fulfilled. We don't need more consultation. We've had two and a half years since the review. Yeah. We need swift action, immediate implementation of the proposals, and urgent legislative change where it is necessary. After 18 years of the gambling industry's dominance <coughs> over this agenda, now is the time for levelling up. So I ask the Secretary of State, will she commit today to ensuring that these changes are brought in as a priority with no delay in tactics? Let us protect those who have lives have been affected by gambling-related harm and let's stop lining the pockets of an industry who have had it of their own way for far too long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to thank and hugely commend uh, the Honourable Member for Swansea East for all her work. Um, she, she has highlighted we have listened. Uh, and taken action. Um, I, and I really do commend her and thank her for her, for her work. Uh, as I said, I've been in post for, for two and a half months. I brought this legislation forward. She, cannot, uh, she can be reassured that uh, I will continue to ensure, uh, together with uh, my junior minister, that this uh, action happens swiftly. She will know that following on from a white paper, there are various technical consultations uh, that need to take place. We need to bring forward these measures, uh, largely through statutory instruments, and that is a process, but she has my utmost commitment to ensure that that is done as speedily as possible. Philip Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I refer people to my entries in the Register of Members' Interests? Can I ask the Secretary of State how many regular punters she spoke to before bringing forward these proposals, particularly in relation to affordability checks at the rather bizarre and arbitrary figures of £1,000 a day or £2,000 over 90 days, which I think amounts to £22 a day by my reckoning. The Conservative Party used to believe in individual freedom and individual responsibility, but that seems to have gone out of the window with these affordability check proposals. Can she tell me when an affordability check is made, who decides whether or not an individual can afford the amount that they're gambling? Will it be the government? Will it be the gambling commission? Will it be the bookmakers? Or will it be the banks? And do the punters themselves get any say at all over how uh, they can afford to spend their own hard-earned money? I, I, I thank the, my honourable friend and for his engagement uh, on this issue. And I, I know that he, uh, like many others, wants to ensure that people, punters who enjoy a bet, who enjoy a flutter, are not prevented from doing so. He asks what engagement we've had. 44% of adults 
Gamble, and we've spoken to quite a lot of them. Uh, we've had uh, 400 meetings on this issue to ensure that we take into account uh, all perspectives. And this is about this. The, legis the uh, white paper that we're putting forward today is about balance. It's about ensuring that people can go about their business doing what they enjoy um, without restriction, but at the same time protecting those people uh, that need protection. And uh, those those checks that he talks about. Um, most people will not even know that they are happening. Uh, they will be frictionless. They'll happen behind the scenes. For 80% of people, they will nothing at all. For 20% of people, that will just be a simply a check on whether you've been made bankrupt or whether you've got a county court judgment against you. You will not know that that check is taking place. It's take, those sorts of checks take place in a whole variety of different instances, uh, but they are there to ensure that in the very small percentage of cases, uh, where an operator needs to double check that somebody it might be going down the wrong road, that those checks take place. Those, I should emphasise, those checks are already taking place. Gambling companies already have a responsibility uh, to ensure uh, protection of those that gamble with them. And what we're trying to do is to protect people like the nurse who spent £245,000 uh, over a period of a few months when the gambling company knew that she had a salary of £30,000. Those are the sorts of instances that we want to stop uh, with our proposals in the White Paper. Uh, Clive Efford. De Deputy Speaker, I, I, I welcome today's, today's White Paper, but can I just ask a question uh, on the issue of the statutory levy? because it's all well and good uh, imposing a statutory levy, and I welcome that, but how that money is used is vital, and it has to be independent of the industry. The researchers mm -hmm. have to have access and free and open access to the data, and they have to be free to choose what research they undertake, and those in the gambling industry should not have any sway over what is researched and what is not. Yeah. Well, I, I can give uh, my, uh, the Honourable Member the assurances he wants uh, that uh, they will not have a say in what the money is spent on, and we will ensure that that money is spent appropriately. Stephen Crabb. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the tone that the Minister is striking today in uh, tackling problem gambling and particularly protecting vulnerable people is, of course, essential. Does the Minister recognise that the gambling industry, whether it's to everyone's taste or not, does have a symbiotic relationship? with grassroots sport in this, in this country and not just horse racing. So what steps is the Minister going to take to ensure that it, with the regulation that she is rightly taking forward, we don't damage grassroots sport in this country? Well, um, I'm very grateful for the intervention of my right honourable friend because he's made a really important point. Uh, we have a world-class industry that brings in, uh, that has revenues of billions of pounds, um, who is uh, putting money through its taxes uh, to support many of our public services. Um, and for the majority of people, um, it is offering something that they enjoy. So that is why we're trying to strike this balance, uh, uh, this balance between allowing that to continue whilst at the same time protecting um, problem gamblers. There are th uh, we estimate around 300,000 problem gamblers uh, and, and, and protect those at the same time. Ronnie Cowan. Well, Deputy Speaker. I welcome the statement. I haven't had time to read the 250 pages of the White Paper, and I'm sure the devil is definitely going to be in the detail. I'm not as enamoured by the statement as other members seem to be. I'm delighted that our hard work has been recognised. I think it's really important today that we recognise the hard work of those campaigners, the yeah. people who have lived experience, the people who have lost loved ones, yeah, who have yeah. completed suicide through their addictions to gambling, and the hard work they've done to bring me to this place and to allow me to express their opinion to uh, and the smart levy answer was, was the smart levy question was going to be one of mine. I'm delighted to hear that industry are not going to have their fingers on that pie. That money must be ring fenced and channeled through the NHS so it's used properly. Uh, I'd see one line in the statement says working with industry and gambling commission. I would just caution there, they are part of the problem. And if we're going to work with them, you have to work with people who have experienced the gambling harm in the first place to get a balanced view on this. And I'd echo the, the sentiments of the member from Chingford and say, if we're taking football adverts off the front of shots for EPL teams voluntarily, that should be uh, encased in law. What happens to kids who follow a championship team, or first division team, or second division team, or an SPL team in Scotland? Those children are still going to be exposed to those adverts, and yet we're acknowledging that they do harm. If the adverts do harm, they've all got to do, all got to go, all shots, all round the stadium, 
all around the pitch, in between games, on the television, on the radio. If advertising does harm, all advertising has to go. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to commend uh, the Honourable Member for the work that he's done in, the, uh, in this area. And also, he, he rightly recognises the work of a whole range of gambling uh, campaigners who are, have been affected by this issue. And I'm really pleased to have met uh, many, gambling group, many gambling campaign groups to hear their stories and see how they uh, have been affected. He's right to talk about uh, advertising towards young children, and that's why it's already prohibited uh, to target adverts uh, towards young children. I, I must say we, we, we must welcome what the Premier League has done, and as I have said, the statutory levy uh, will enable us to look at this issue further, and uh, if necessary, of course, we can take other steps in the future. Greg Whitaker. Deputy Speaker, and can I refer members to my registered interest as well? My right honourable friend has said that she wants to protect the vulnerable uh, with this review, which is a name that everybody in this House wants to achieve. But you can understand my surprise, though, uh, that in her statement we see no mention of the fact that in just under half an hour you can Google non-gambling aware bets and you find over 400 regulated sites with no protection or checks for the vulnerable. We see little or, or, or no mention of the scourge of scratch cards to protect the vulnerable. And I also didn't hear a mention uh, companies that are for profit fundraisers who openly advertise to the vulnerable as well. So will my right honourable friend agree with me that unless gambling in the round is considered and in a balanced way, the aim of protecting the vulnerable will still be being debated in this place in the next 20 years? Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend for his points. It is a very extensive um, white paper, and many people have mentioned the 250 pages. And within that, there are a lot of provisions to protect a lot of people. Um, he, he rightly mentions uh, that we need to stop punters going to the black market, and we need to strengthen gambling commission and local authority powers and resources. And that's one of the things that is highlighted in the white paper that members will have an opportunity. Uh, to read when they have a little more time. The, the regulator will be able to block or take down black market operators and, where necessary, suspend or take away licences uh, from companies uh, which break the rules. As well as I mentioned already, we are um, increasing the age for a number of other types of gambling. Uh, Paul Bromfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Secretary of State for acknowledging the work of my constituents, Liz and Charles Ritchie, and for her engagement with them, uh, and indeed the engagement of her predecessors. While warmly welcoming much in this statement, as I do, I know that Charles and Liz will be, along with other families bereaved by gambling addiction, deeply disappointed by the failure to tackle advertising, yeah, yeah. and particularly in football, she rightly highlighted, and others have too, the shocking number of children who are addicts or have problems with gambling, 11-year-old and, and, uh, and, and younger. Now, for many, football is the hook. Now, in the action that they took, the Premier League recognised that advertising is harmful, but a front-of-shirt ban isn't enough. Fans are exposed to an average 700 ads at every Premier League game. Now, other countries have acted. So will the Secretary of State think again on that issue? Because the campaign for comprehensive action on advertising won't stop. Well, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for his points. And it's been an honour to uh, speak with uh, the riches who have articulated uh, their case uh, so well. Um, and I know uh, that they and others would like us to go further, as I am sure the gambling companies would like us to go less far. And so what this white paper does is seek a balance between allowing people to go about their lives uh, who are not suffering harm at the same time as protecting those people uh, who unfortunately are harmed. 
Uh, we, the position already is in relation to advertising that you cannot uh, target advertise, advertisements should not target children. We've seen the measures taken uh, by the Premier League, which uh, the government uh, was. Uh, uh, very, very uh, firm, and uh, made its position very clear to the Premier League as to um, the action they they ought to consider taking. And as I have already mentioned, we will look uh, very carefully at any further research that comes out, and uh, would take action if that was necessary. So, Desmond Swain, will she take this opportunity to review the uh, dated and rather severe? A regulatory regime in which the lotter postcode lottery and the hospice lotteries have to operate under? Uh, well, I know society lottery, uh, lotteries uh, bring in uh, valuable revenues that are um, enjoyed by uh, communities. One of the changes that we are making is in relation to raising the age uh, to ensure that we protect young people, uh, but always happy to continue to look at the work that they are doing. Speller? Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I refer to my entry in the Member's Register? The Minister read out almost a race card of her predecessors, and so can we congratulate her on the, sh in the short time with which she's managed to get out this white paper to get a much better public debate? But isn't the danger that any regime will be vulnerable to offshore, out-of-jurisdiction opera operators who flout the regulations and undermine legitimate companies? So will she mobilise a whole-of-government approach, including the crime agencies, the Treasury and the banks, to tackle the gambling black market to ensure the success of her reforms while also protecting a major British industry and its workers? Yeah, uh, the Honourable Member makes an important point because people have said to me, if you tighten up the rules uh, in relation to legitimate gambling, all you're going to do is drive punters offshore. And that is why, in this white paper, we are also stopping punters going to the black market because we're strengthening uh, the Gambling Commission and local authorities' powers and resources. And the regulator will now be able to block or take down black market operators and, where necessary, suspend or take away licences from companies who break the rules. Selene Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And very much in the same vein, whilst welcoming so much of today's, um, your, the Secretary of State is quite right that it is the advent of smartphones which has seen such a change in gambling behaviour. And what more is actually being done so that if you choose not to um, pursue a legitimate operator because you don't want the affordability checks or some of the other new regimes, just pressing Google and finding so much more. Is there going to be more being done really to clamp down on the black market, particularly when it's so accessible just through your handheld device? Uh, yes, I can confirm that the, the regulator will be able to block or take down black market operators or, where necessary, suspend licenses, licenses from companies who break the rules. Uh, Jamie Stone. Madam Deputy Speaker, 400 people a year, around about that number, take their own lives each year going to gambling harms. It is rather a personal issue for me and for my home community because a much-loved GP uh, in 2007 did exactly that, and he's still missed today. We all mourn his passing. It's a very moving memorial to him outside the local health centre. So can I, can I say to the government, can we crack on with this as fast as humanly possible? Because you know, if we'd had this legislation some years ago, this gentleman might, might be still with us. Um, well, I, the, I, I, my thoughts are with all those who have lost their family members, and I hope they will look on today as a, a moment where, which they have contributed to. Um, I know it has taken some time, but I would like to point out, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this is the largest reform that we've had since 2005. It is game-changing, um, and it, was t it is, of course, right that, that where we bring our regulations up to the smartphone age, uh, we take the time to make sure that we get those regulations right. Mark Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Deputy 
Deputy Speaker. I welcome today's statement and look forward to reading uh, the White Paper and the measures within it. However, it does feel like a sense of deja vu in that every time uh, we look to clamp down on an area in which people, vulnerable people, are being exploited and the gambling industry profits off of their vulnerability, they move on to find a new platform or a new method in which they can exploit. So, what sort of confidence does the Secretary of State have in the future proofing of these measures? And will she commit to making sure that there are constant reviews of this legislation? Because the gambling industry is very powerful and has a big and very persuasive approach to this place. And it is important that these vulnerable people are protected. Uh, well, my Honourable Friend makes a, a very important point. We, of course, need to keep matters under review. And I think the statutory levy will enable us and help us do that to ensure not only do we keep up uh, with what's happening in technology, but we also have the evidence to back up any policy changes uh, that we need to bring forward. Ian Mayans. Deputy Speaker. Um, the end of gambling company sponsorship on Premier League team shirts is, of course, a welcome step by the Premier League, but that's not until the end of the 2025 2026 season, three years hence. It is not good enough, there's not enough urgency within that. And everyone who watches sports coverage, particularly <coughs> football on TV, are constantly bombarded with images and repetitious advertisements urging them to partake in gambling games, spot bets, betting up as for particular scores or match outcomes. What are children watching those <coughs> matches on TV meant to do? Hide behind the sofa, cover their eyes, put their fingers in their ears. It, they're being bombarded constantly by this. It has become far too normalised and is, <coughs> is, we know, damaging lives now with regularity. Action and urgency is imperative. Uh, I, I, think I recognise the points the honourable member is making, but I, I would like to. Um, congratulate the Premier League on the action they've taken because they have talked about it for a long time and they have now taken action. Uh, and so too today the White Paper brings in a large number of options, uh, uh, actions that really uh, will make a significant uh, difference. Uh, of course, we will uh, obviously uh, con keep matters uh, under review, but the statutory levy will help us and enable us to do that. Greg Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It was ever thus that when governments <coughs> ban or curtail legitimate activities, underground markets do bubble up to fill that void. And I was struck by uh, some evidence from the Institute of Economic Affairs that shows even without things like stake limits, 5% of UK gamblers have used unlicensed and unregulated sites, and half could actually name a site to go to to gamble in an unregulated way. So whilst I hear uh, the measures that she has outlined around greater powers for the Gambling Commission, Gambling Commission to shut down black market operators, what assessment has she made of the volume of current gamblers that could move to underground uh, gambling? And does she think that the Gambling Commission, even with their new powers, would actually be able to keep up with that? So it is important that we ensure that we protect people um, from both legitimate gambling where we have problem gamblers but also um, the black market. I would just like to emphasise uh, one important point though because some of the measures that we've brought in today are already, being, uh, are already in place for some companies. So some responsible companies are already taking measures that we have announced today. Uh, and they have punters, and they have successful operations. The issue is that not all companies are doing the right thing. And so what our measures do is seek to ensure consistency across the board uh, so that we ensure that the people who are, right, who are doing the right thing are not prejudiced and that we protect uh, those people who might become problem gamblers. Um, Carol Monaghan. Speaker, the Secretary of State has said in her statement that she will ensure that children can do no forms of gambling, including online gambling. Can she confirm whether that will be through an age verification process and how exactly will that operate? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, well, it is already uh, the case that it is illegal for people to be um, uh, gambling online, and there are also some protections in place. And of course, we will uh, continue to ensure that those protections are strengthened. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, clearly, there is a delicate balance between addiction and the safe enjoyment of gambling, and as always, the devil will be in the detail. But what assurances can my right honourable friend provide today that these proposed reforms will not negatively impact people's enjoyment of a day at the races, or perhaps a football bet on a Saturday, or a night at the bingo? And also, our much loved British sports, including horse racing, which employ thousands of people across the UK directly and indirectly. For, for those people who are betting occasionally and for a matter of enjoyment, um, these, these uh, measures will not make any difference. That those people will still be able to enjoy their leisure activities. What these measures are designed to do is to uh, help and protect those people who are problem gamblers, whose lives are potentially going to be ruined. So I, you know, can I still encourage those people who want to take part in what is an enjoyable and leisurable leisure activity for millions of people across the country. We are trying to strike the right balance there. Andrew Gwynne. Thank you. I welcome a number of the measures that she set out today, including the statutory levy, but also importantly, I think for most, if not all of us in this House, uh, the protections for children and young people, particularly in the online sphere. Given that technology moves at a great pace and many of the advances that we've seen in technology uh, and the problems associated with it when it comes to uh, gambling since 2005 could not have been foreseen 18 years ago, what assurances can she give, not only that the rules that she's setting out now will be updated in future, but also that the powers and the resources and the capacity of the new regulator will also be kept up to date with the moves in technology. Well, it is fundamental that we continue to look at this issue as technology changes, but uh, the Honourable Member mentioned the statutory levy. So the statutory levy will enable us to have research, make evidence-based policy, but it will also allow uh, if appropriate, um, education, education of young people, uh, so that even when technology changes, they understand the issues that may face them. Shannon? Oh, sorry, ma'am, that was fair. Um, can I, first of all, thank, thank the, uh, um, the uh, Secretary of State very much for the statement uh, and on the Gambling Act review. I, I feel, and indeed many of us feel here, positive progress, so well done, Secretary of State, on that. I myself have concerns with the accessibility of gambling on uh, smartphones, and I want to ask a specific question, if I can. Um, as a photo of the ID to prove age on betting apps is necessary, some under 18s have been buying fake IDs to enable them to bet under age online. So, what discussions has the Secretary of State had with large betting organisations to do more in depth scrutiny into the legitimacy of ID used for betting? Thank you. Of course, it is of course important that we protect uh, young people. It is important uh, that people do not gamble under the age of 18, and of course, betting companies uh, have to ensure uh, that uh, people are following their rules. Robert Ferrier. Mr. Speaker, as a vice chair of the Gambling Related Harm (APPG), I thank the Secretary of State for her statement and welcome the long-awaited white paper. There's parts of it I don't agree with, but that's for another day. This month, the UK saw the opening of the first women-only residential treatment centre for gambling addiction. It's catered towards women's needs, including a consideration to childcare demands, as women, on average, spend less time in treatment than men. For, for this reason. Does the Minister agree that this highlights the need for an intersectional, public health focused and free to access treatment programme which offers tailored support to those who require it? Well, I was very pleased in my engagement to speak with clinicians who are dealing with uh, gambling harm. Um, and I'm very pleased that the statutory levy will ensure that NHS trusts. Uh, will take the funding that previously they have turned away uh, because of where the money was coming from. So I do think that the measures that we're bringing forward today uh, will help those people get the support that they need. I thank the Secretary of State uh, for her statement, and we now move to.
Business Statement, Leader of the House. Oh, I thought you were. I thought you Perhaps were if I were just explain it, because it's turned into a statement, you're first on Leader of the House. Always learn something in this place. The business for the week commencing the 1st of May will include Monday the 1st of May, uh, the House will not be sitting, Tuesday the 2nd of May, consideration of Lords' amendments to the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, followed by a general debate on support for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. The subjects for these, this debate was determined by the Backbench Business Committee. Wednesday the 3rd of May, consideration of Lords' amendments to the National Security Bill, followed by remaining stages of the Lifelong Learning Higher Education Fee Limits Bill. The House will rise for the coronation recess at the conclusion of business on Wednesday the 3rd of May and return on Tuesday the 9th of May. The provisional business for the week commencing the 8th of May includes on Monday the 8th of May, the House will not be sitting, on Tuesday the 9th of May, second reading of the Energy Bill Lords, Wednesday the 10th of May, consideration of an allocation of time motion, followed by all stages of the Northern Ireland Interim Arrangements Bill. Thursday the 11th of May, a debate on a motion on the future of overseas territories, followed by a general debate on no recourse to public funds. The subjects for these debates were determined by the Backbench Business Committee. On Friday the 12th of May, the House will not be sitting. The provisional business for the week commencing the 15th of May includes on Monday the 15th of May, second reading of the Victims and Prisoners Bill. Shadow Leader of the House, Thangam Debonair. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Leader for the forthcoming business. But first, on behalf of the 43 staff and all the others who haven't asked me directly, those 43 have, who want to book their holidays, please, can we have some recess dates? As soon as we get back, maybe there's no business questions next week, so maybe the one after that. Right, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's amazing to see the Right Honourable Lady has still got it the former magician's assistant who can abracadabra a brand new illegal migration bill just like that. Yeah. That's what it felt like yesterday with countless new government amendments to their own bill. Report stage is the new second reading now. Can the leader tell us why they were not in the bill when it was first published two months ago? or debated at committee stage, isn't piling the bill with amendments at the last minute just another tyrannical Tory tactic to swerve scrutiny? Absolutely. Madam Deputy Speaker, you can add illusionist to the leader's, mag leader's magical talents too. She must have conjured up the image in my own head of her telling me she was hoping to see the impact assessment for the bill. After how many times I've asked for it, I was hopeful. She seemed so confident. She said she'd ask the Home Secretary directly. And yet here we are. It's a day after, and here it isn't. So. Could she magic it up now so at least the Lords can see it before they debate it? Home Office Ministers, it seems, can't even answer the most basic questions on how this bill will work. Perhaps the Leader can have a go now at just one. Does she know how many former RAF bases the Government needs to accommodate the tens of thousands of people who will be detained under the new law? I would say she doesn't, and the Home Secretary won't tell her either. Has anybody anybody actually worked it out? Or is this just the Home Secretary winging it? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a Tory party in disarray. Yeah. The highly respected Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, a former Prime Minister, rightly respected for her work on modern slavery, attacked this Tory bill for giving traffickers, traffickers, Madam Deputy Speaker, greater leverage over victims to keep them in slavery. And the blue on blue continued, with others concerned about safe and legal routes. Now, we had amendments on both of these and on tackling terrorism and any number of other things which the members opposite could have voted for. And at the end of business yesterday, the member for South Dorset gave his minister a tough time over a lack of local consultation on asylum seeker accommodation. Now, that reminds me, oh yes, just an hour, but previously, Labour had given him the opportunity to vote for 
wait for it, an amendment on local consultation on asylum seeker accommodation. Where was he when it came to votes? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, pick a bill, any bill, and the government's utter disdain for this House, its members, and by extension the British people, is clear. Yeah. Bills chopping and changing as they wrangle their backbenchers into place, which is no way to run a rodeo. Poor policy, lazy lawmaking, gutless governments who know their policies can't withstand proper scrutiny. Now, one of our scrutiny tools, Madam Deputy Speaker, is opposition days. The leader can't just wave her magic wand to cut the cost of living crisis. She actually has to vote for it. So why then did she and the rest of the Tories vote against Labour's plans to cut the cost of living for her constituents on Tuesday? 13 years of Tory governments crashing, mismanaging the economy, wages squeezed, inflation more than 10%, soaring mortgages and rents, food prices rising at their fastest in 45 years, and the government's answer to their own mess? No rabbits out the hat, Madam Deputy Speaker, just 24 Tory tax rises since 2019, the highest tax burden in 70 years. 7 0. On Tuesday, Labour gave the Tories a chance to abolish the non DOM tax loophole, another chance, so that the super rich who live and work here can pay their fair share of taxes. Labour would choose to spend that on more health staff and on breakfast clubs for kids, but the Tories voted against it. We also gave the Tories a chance to extend the windfall tax on oil and gas profits. Labour would choose to spend that on easing the cost of living crisis by freezing council tax this year, but no, the Tories voted against it. Politics is about choices, Madam Deputy Speaker, and the government is choosing non-DOMs and oil and gas giants over working people. Labour will not waste valuable time here on performative bills that only make people's lives worse, as the Tories are choosing to do now. Labour will cut the cost of living, cut waiting lists and cut crime. That's the difference, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's the choice next Thursday. So can I wish all Labour candidates in the elections the very best of luck? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Leader of the House. Madam Deputy Speaker, well, can I first of all start by uh, echoing what the Secretary of State for DCMS said uh, earlier uh, today, just uh, with regard to the coronation and putting on record my thanks uh, to all members who are helping their constituents prepare for that incredible moment for our country uh, and everyone working to ensure that event can go ahead uh, safely, including uh, a lot of uh, members of staff of the, uh, of the House, uh, and I encourage everyone to take part in that. Uh, the Honourable Lady um, rightly presses me on recess dates, and I do understand how uh, important this is, not just for members, but for staff. And uh, I hope to be able to uh, announce those uh, very, very shortly, and uh, we'll ensure that uh, we, we do so. Uh, she raises the very important matter of uh, the uh, illegal migration uh, bill, and uh, I can only conclude from Labour's behaviour this week and what the Honourable Lady has said that they are happy with the status quo. We are determined to ensure that the finite resource we have is best used to support the most vulnerable and those that we have a particular moral obligation to. And that is the purpose of this bill. Uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult stuff that we are doing. Uh, it's why we have carefully thought this out. She is right. I agree uh, impact assessments are very important. Uh, the impact assessment on this bill will be published today. And uh, I, uh, uh, in advance of uh, its, its uh, hopeful swift progress uh, through the uh, House of Lords, uh, the, the Honourable Lady um, has uh, told many uh, jokes at my expense and my, my former career as a magician's assistant. Uh, but I think it is a, it is a little rich. Uh, because if there, are, uh, if there are people in this place who should be accused of uh, uh, illusions and sleight of hand, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is uh, Labour's approach, even to its own uh, Opposition Day uh, debate uh, this week. Um, the Honourable Lady's accounts of, of what has happened in that respect rival the narratives of Comical Alley for their accuracy and uh, situational awareness. What happened was that Labour, together with the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party, passed up the chance to vote for or against a motion this week 
that set targets for reducing sewage discharges and would um, financially penalise companies that did not uh, honour their uh, duties. Uh, only the Conservatives voted for that, and only the Conservatives have done something about it. And ditto on the cost of uh, living issue that the Honourable uh, Lady uh, raises, and particularly on sewage. Uh, the uh, the Honourable Lady uh, may may know that actually Labour have pulled. Uh, all their attack ads on this issue uh, for the, the local election campaign because they have been found out. Their campaign has been a deliberate distraction, or perhaps given the matter under discussion, uh, I should say a stool pigeon, uh, from the reality of uh, ending storm overflows, uh, which is an important matter for our constituents. Labour are being found out. They've been found out on sewage this week. They've been exposed for saying that they will freeze council tax when they more than doubled it in government, and every single one of Labour's councils covering every single member of the Shadow Cabinet haven't frozen it. They've hiked it up. They say they want a compassionate, fair, effective asylum system, but they won't take the tough decisions to deliver one. And they say they are tough on crime, but consistently block measures to protect the public. The Labour Party are supposed to be an alternative government. That's what they're supposed to look like. This week, they haven't even looked like an eff effective protest group. Andrew Percy. Thank you. Madam Speaker, this morning the Centre for uh, Countering Digital Hate has issued a shocking report into the online activities of Press TV, particularly uh, their use of a video series called Palestine Declassified, which focuses its hatred on British Jews. Amongst other things on social media, Press TV have uh, been promoting claims that Jews are involved in 9-11, in Covid conspiracies, and they have promoted articles claiming the Holocaust is the greatest lie ever told. Whilst Press TV may be banned from our airways, this foreign state hate operation is continuing online. Uh, can we have a debate at some point on what more we can do uh, to uh, ensure that social media platforms uh, tackle this outrageous content? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this very important matter. It should be a concern to all members of this House uh, that these dangerous um, and, uh, in, in many cases, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are, uh, are still able to be uh, promoted and, uh, and do gain traction. Uh, he will know I take this matter very seriously and um, gave a speech uh, uh, a couple of months ago uh, on this matter. I think it is an excellent uh, topic uh, for debate and there is currently a member's survey going on, Madam Deputy Speaker, about further services the Library could provide, including in, amongst many other um, uh, questions that members are being asked. And I think making sure that we can all really understand what is going on with this kind of campaign, uh, who is behind it, uh, is, is a very good thing we should consider. SNP spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week, the Leader of the House and her opposite number, when gleefully celebrating the supposed woes of the SNP, pitched their tent so high on the moral high ground it's a wonder they didn't get altitude sickness. But my goodness, life comes at you fast. Seven days on and a bullying scandal has claimed the, the career of a Tory Deputy Prime Minister, where the Labour Party's interfactional warfare continues to spill out into the public domain with a former <laughs> ho home, Shadow Home Secretary following a party leader out of the door. And tempted as I am, Madam Deputy Speaker, given last week's shenanigans, I'll make no further comment save to say that perhaps we should have a government-led debate on the UK glazing industry and the benefit it would gain from people in glass houses being addicted to throwing stones. <laughs> but I will add one, and that is a thank you, because the more the hysterical attacks you, they, they put on us, the more our membership grows, up 3,000 in the last couple of weeks to 75,000. How that compares to other members and uh, Scottish political parties, we'll never know. Because as far as the unions are concerned, transparency is strictly for other people. Which means, Madam Deputy Speaker, for all we know, there could be literally hundreds, hundreds of Scottish Tories running around and we just wouldn't know. But I'll tell you who was transparent last week, Madam Deputy Speaker, Lord Frost. 
the unelected, indeed the never elected brains behind Brexit, who finally said out loud what they are all been thinking when he said, note, not only must there be no more powers devolved to Scotland, but it's time to reverse the process. And the emboldened Lord doubled down when on Toy Town TV he said, there has been a lot of private messages from sympathisers within the party saying, keep going, keep talking, this needs to be said. So, can we have a debate so that the Leader of the House and the rest of our colleagues can rally around the global North Lord Frost and his attempts to quell Scottish democracy. Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, um, I, I, whatever um, political party uh, people support, I'm always encouraged to hear that uh, uh, membership of political parties is growing. Um, but you'll forgive, uh, I hope the honourable gentleman will forgive me if we don't trust him on the figures. Um, I'm happy to. Um, in, in, all, in all honesty, Madam Deputy Speaker, in all honesty, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm really surprised at uh, what the honourable gentleman has said and his his choice of uh, questioning today. Um, no humility, no regret, no apology. I, I think whatever our political beliefs and differences over our ambitions for the, the union. I think there is a common understanding amongst all of us in this place of the shared values and the principles that underpin our democracy. I hope that is the case. I will never share the belief that the, um, the Honourable Gentleman's uh, party membership hold on, uh, on Scottish independence. Uh, I may also disagree with uh, Lord Frost on occasion. But I do think that I understand the SNP's membership uh, ambitions and what they are they are based on because they are based on the same things that my ambitions for our country are based on too. Self-determination, agency, moral courage, the progress of humanity, the love of country, and how devastating it must be to SNP members and supporters to have placed their hopes and trust at the hands of people who have been so reckless with their dreams and the mandate that they have given them. And, uh, and now they know how many Scottish taxpayers also feel when they look at the SNP's ruinous sell-off and sell-out of their country. And just when you think the farce that has been going on in Scotland over the past weeks, the SNP's great closing down sale can't get any worse. They've just offered a two-for-one offer, a coalition with Labour. Braveheart has turned out to be Brutus. An affair. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, hundreds, some reports say thousands, of blind and partially sighted people, such as my amazing disability campaigner, Jill Allen King OBE, are facing long waits for replacement guide dogs, some up to 18 months. This is devastating for their mental health and their ability to socialise, not to mention, for some, ability to work. So please, could we have a debate in government time on ways to improve access to work for blind and partially sighted people and to guide dogs and to modern technology, which makes such a difference to their lives? Well, can I thank my hon. Friend for, for raising this very timely uh, question. And I know that she has also uh, recently met with the, the Prime Minister, along with her constituent uh, and her uh, constituent's companion, Jagger, um, uh, who uh, faces reluctant retirement, I understand, uh, uh, shortly. She was absolutely right uh, that we, we want to increase access uh, to this, uh, this vital way that uh, people can, uh, can go about and achieve their ambitions in life. She knows that she will have missed equalities questions this week. That has just uh, happened. Uh, but I will follow up uh, on this with the Department of Work and Pensions for her. Chair of the Backbench Business Committee, Ian Mears. I am very grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can, can I thank the Leader of the House for the, business, for, for the business statement and for announcing the Backbench Business for the next two weeks? And um, I was wondering if she could help me um, with some words of consolation for my good friend, Mr Mark Allen, who I took as my guest to St James's Park last Sunday. Mark is the proprietor of a licensed premises known to me 
in Kennington, but is also sadly for him a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. Oh, 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 oh. Um, he's a very stoic Tottenham Hotspur supporter, but despite his stoicism, uh, Sunday's events come as a bit of a shock to him. So I'm wondering if the if the leader of the house could say a word of consolation for him. And and lastly, ma Madam Deputy Speaker, tomorrow is work as Memorial Day, where we commemorate all those killed, injured or made unwell by their work. So can we just recognise the, the 28th of April every year is Workers' Memorial Day, where we remember the dead and fight for the living? Yeah. Yeah. Leader of the Hat. Well, can I thank um, the, the honourable gentleman uh, for all the work that he's doing on his committee and the, the debates that we were able to announce uh, in the business statement. And I, I will commiserate uh, with uh, his uh, friend uh, and Spurs fans everywhere who are very familiar with coping with Spurs being a bit Spursy, but uh, um, have been tested to uh, their limits, I think, in, uh, and I, I, I wish them well uh, for the, the future. And thank him for uh, reminding us of this important uh, Memorial Day, uh, certainly as a Portsmouth MP, uh, and the, the volume of uh, uh, constituents and uh, their family members who would have suffered from uh, mesothelioma and other uh, uh, such uh, related issues. It's a very important uh, Memorial Day, and I thank him for raising it. Darren Henry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to request that time be made for this House to discuss the growing issue of houses in multiple occupation, HMO, in the towns of Beeston and Chilwell, in my constituency of Broxstow, I am receiving a growing number of HMOs being improved by government following initial rejection by the local council. One of these HMOs resulted in contractors' damage to a water main and multiple houses being destroyed as a result. These decisions are having a huge impact on local families and communities, and it is essential that time is made to discuss this rising problem and ensure that these decisions are being made for the community and not to their detriment. Thank you. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for, for raising this important point? It will be uh, an issue that uh, will be a concern for many uh, members, particularly those that, uh, uh, that, that are in uh, constituencies that are already very uh, densely populated. Uh, he will know that. Uh, the levelling up bill and some consultations that were also done around us as part of that bill going through this House uh, are looking at uh, measures where we can ensure that the, particularly the type of HMOs it, it are the right ones. Um, uh, for example, uh, young professionals that might want to uh, share accommodation, have separate bedrooms and bathrooms, but shared living accommodation. We want to encourage the right kind of development that's going to enhance communities, uh, and I would uh, certainly encourage him and all other members who are concerned to apply for a debate in the usual way. Joanna Cherry. Oh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it's, uh, it's Lesbian Visibility Week. Yet, as my alma mater, Edinburgh University, flew the lesbian visibility flag yesterday and advocated for inclusion, last night it failed for a second time to stop a masked mob from preventing the screening of a documentary called Adult Human Female. The film features feminists and lesbians, including my friends Dr Shireen Benjamin, Lucy Massoud and Professor Joe Phoenix, talking about how important it is to be heard about their lesbian identity and experience. So can I ask the Leader of the House, can we have a debate about how we prevent lesbian erasure and the intimidation of lesbians in our civic life, including at our universities? Well, can I thank the um, Honourable Lady for, for raising this important point and say how sorry I am to, uh, to hear that. Uh, it's incredibly important that uh, we, uh, we allow people to, uh, to debate issues, uh, discuss issues, uh, but also uh, view films and, and so forth. And uh, when people are uh, presented with a, a situation that is intimidating or upsetting or violent, that is in incredibly uh, disappointing uh, to hear that. I think this is a particular uh, issue for, uh, for lesbians because the, uh, historically the 
uh, LGBT movement has uh, given them a lower profile than uh, um, gay men, for example. So I think it is incredibly important that we're very aware of those sorts of issues. And I shall certainly make sure that uh, uh, both the Minister for Women and Equalities, uh, but also the Home Secretary, have heard her concerns. Bob Blackman. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I too was at St James's Park, and I'm still getting over it. Uh, but at least Tottenham are refunding the gate money from the, from the game. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, today is the 64th day that Vahid Baheshti is on hunger strike opposite the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. I wrote, together with 125 other members of both Houses, last week to the Prime Minister, copied to the Foreign Secretary and, in, and to the Home Secretary about his hunger strike, drawing attention to the plight of the poor people in Iran and the need to prescribe the IRGC in its entirety. I'm pleased that, that he's had a meeting together with Lord Ahmed and with the Security Minister uh, relatively recently, but there is still no action from the Government. So could we have a debate in Government time on what measures we're going to take to prescribe the IRGC in its entirety? Let us have a vote on it um, so that the Government can support it and then make it actuality. Leader of the House. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for, for raising this important point? We are we were all extremely worried uh, about uh, the fact that he is on the, the 64th day of this uh, hunger strike. I visited him uh, a, much earlier uh, in, the, in the first month uh, that, that he has been doing this. And he is doing it, I think, not just because of the situation in uh, Iran, but also increasingly the situation we're facing here in the UK too, with people being intimidated, threatened, uh, or worse, uh, by um, uh, this, uh, this regime and, uh, uh, and their proxies. Um, I hope that he will soon bring this hunger strike to an end. I understand why he is doing it. Glad that ministers have met with him, and the honourable gentleman may wish to raise this again uh, with the foreign secretary on the 2nd of May. Uh, Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. One of my constituents has been part of the BBC Singers for 15 years, and her husband is currently on trial with a BBC orchestra, which takes years of training and practice. They were just beginning to get their lives back on track after COVID when the BBC announced they were closing the singers and cutting orchestra jobs by 20%. Although that decision has been paused, their futures and those of these great cultural institutions remain uncertain. So can we please have a statement from the Culture Secretary outlining what the government will do to help save these jobs and protect our rich musical heritage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I Even thank the, uh, the Honourable Lady and all members who have raised the matter, particularly of the BBC Singers, which is the BBC's only uh, choral uh, group, and uh, I would say that it is uh, in, in very great part um, down to the campaigning and concerns of members of this House uh, that contributed to the BBC taking a pause uh, on that decision. And the Honourable Lady is absolutely right to continue to raise the concern that, uh, that she has uh, about this. She will know that we have just had uh, DCMS questions, uh, so I shall just make sure that the Secretary of State has heard her continuing concern on this Virginia Crosby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Adrian Edwards, the Mayor of Holyhead, is due to step down soon. Adrian has given many years of service to Holyhead and has helped raise vital funds for the charity Holyhead Cancer Support Group. Would the Leader of the House join me in thanking Adrian and all those across the UK that go the extra mile to support their communities? And would she say Pobluk, good luck to Adrian for the coronation event she is organising in Klangorg Village Hall on Sunday the 7th of May at 2 o'clock? Well, I would be very happy to Adrian join House. my uh, honourable friend in saying thank you to Adrian for, for all yeah. that she has done and also to say Pob Luke, uh, as well for um, her future and particularly the coronation event that she is organising. And I would also note my honourable friend has uh, done her constituency a huge service in providing a mile of free bunting to um, anyone who is going to be putting on a, a coronation event. I think historically, uh, because of uh, political differences in the area, um, such bunting has not been readily available. And I'm glad that she has rectified that. And I hope everyone has a wonderful time. 
Pete Wishart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can you just see the Leader of the House that our response to my honourable friend and his contribution was just about as disastrous as that belly flop in that daft diving contest she was part of? Because we do need that debate on the real intentions about devolution. Because we know the opposed its creation. We know they've been trying to undermine it for the past few years. We've heard Lord Frost saying that it now needs to be reversed. Can she just tell me exactly what it is about a Scottish democratic institution that keeps rejecting Conservatives she doesn't like? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I'm very proud of my uh, belly flop on uh, Splash, Madam Deputy Speaker. I have, a, I have a, Lido, a Lido to show for it, and although it got a considerable number of views on YouTube, it is dwarfed by the number of views I get from my exchanges with the SNP every Thursday. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I have no objection to um, uh, democratic outcomes. I object to the Scottish Nationals Party's objection to democratic outcomes. Right, 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 right. Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In Rutland and Melton, we were recently successful with our £23 million levelling up build. Now, as part of that, and I know colleagues are very happy for me that it went ahead, uh, as part of that, we will be building a Meditech hub, which will build the technologies of the future to support our older ones, our older loved ones, to live safer for longer. Now, we are also in Rutland County Council, currently Conservative, and the number one rated council in the country for social care, despite being a very small council with a significantly elder population. Could my right friend give me advice please on how to secure a visit from the social care minister because I'm really keen that our model is rolled out around the country to improve social care for all. Well can I congratulate my uh, honourable friend for all that she has uh, secured for her community through the, uh, the, the levelling up fund and her work with uh, her um, council leader, the county council leader, uh, Lucy Stevenson, to, to bring that £23 million, uh, into uh, her constituency. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that, that her local community is not resting on its laurels and it's pressing forward with further innovation uh, in this area, and she is right. It's wonderful to share be best practice. It's one of the strengths uh, that we have in this place, and I shall certainly make sure uh, that the uh, social care minister has heard uh, her invitation. Gareth Thomas. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, Monday's bank holiday will be warmly appreciated by hard-working families in Harrow, as I'm sure across the rest of the UK. But the 1st of May is, will also be celebrated by many British Gujaratis, as the uh, day that the state of Gujarat came into being in uh, modern India. There are more than 800,000 uh, British Gujaratis uh, in all uh, walks of life in all parts of the UK. Would she take this opportunity ahead of Gujarat Day to welcome the contribution British Gujaratis make uh, to, our, to our country? Well, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for affording me that opportunity, uh, which I'm, I'm sure will be uh, shared by his sentiments will be shared by all members of this House uh, in, in advance of this important uh, anniversary. They do make a huge uh, contribution to uh, the, the nation uh, and uh, their local communities too, and I thank him for mentioning that today. Nick Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Doncaster City Council does not maintain a register of derelict and empty buildings in my constituency or at all, even though we have plenty, such as the old police station in Connorsbury, Tyrrham Hall in Blackstone, and various houses on Prince's Crescent, Edlington. Surely every council should maintain a register, require the owner to sort it out if it's in, dis in disrepair, and then, if he or she doesn't, step in. How long does a community have to suffer the eyesore and blight of derelict buildings before the local authority comes to its aid? May we have a debate on this topic which blights so many neighbourhoods? Yeah. Well, I'm very disturbed to hear that from the, the Honourable Gentleman because since uh, 2017, local planning authorities in England have been required to maintain and publish uh, brownfield uh, land registry, uh, registers. Um, and uh, it's, it's very disturbing to hear that that 
basic requirement is, is not being done. Uh, we are committed to making the most of, of brownfield land in line with our policies on the national uh, policy uh, planning policy framework. And uh, it is obviously very hard to do that if sites uh, are not identified. So I shall make sure that the um, Secretary of State for Leveling Up has heard uh, this situation and, uh, and ask his officials to provide some advice to the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, John Trickett. Can I invite the leader to consider to imagine the situation of a family who were unable to acquire a house, then rent one, put all their love and money and investment into that house, and suddenly, with less than two months' notice, receive a Section 21 notice from the landlord to quit? That's happened to my constituents. Chris and Sandra Taylor was highlighted on the ITV programme uh, calendar. Now, can I just quietly say to the Speaker, that the, the Leader, that there have been commitments by Ministers over the years to end this. As she considers the next parliamentary session, the King's Speech, will she just give an undertaking to the House that this loophole will finally be ended? Thank you, Honourable Gentleman, the for raising this very important point. He will know that the Secretary of State for Leveling Up and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, are very focused on ensuring that, uh, uh, that those who are renting uh, are protected. As well as the situation the honourable gentleman describes, that there are knock on effects for kids attending school. Uh, it's an incredibly difficult situation. He knows that we are focused on this uh, and we will be focused on it as we go into the fourth session. Andy Carter. Mr Ship Canal runs right through the middle of my constituency. It has three main A roads crossing it, in addition to the M6 Thelwall Viaduct, which opened 60 years ago this year. Three of the roads that cross the canal via swing bridges are regularly opened and boats pass through, but they're all controlled and owned by the Ship Canal owner, Peel Ports. And that's regulated under an 1885 Act, which sets out original obligations at a time when, basically, there weren't many cars on the roads. The bridges need urgent, essential repairs, but because the Council and Peel Ports can't agree a closure schedule, they're frequently breaking down, stuck open, so cars can't get across the Manchester Ship Canal. Can we have a debate to look at reviewing the 1885 Act so that the highways infrastructure in Warrington isn't under the control of a business that isn't playing its part to minimise delays and disruption in my town. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising that and for uh, knocking heads together, I think he has done uh, this afternoon. Uh, it, is, it sounds to me that the, uh, that the Council and the uh, ship canal owner, Peel Ports, need to uh, sit down and, and work this out for the, for the benefit of all. Uh, if his business question today uh, has not had that result, he will know how to apply for an adjournment debate, uh, and uh, I hope that will not be necessary. Marion Fellows. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I'm about to have an oh mum moment when I go on about something. My children always use that phrase. So I'm going on about redundancy modification orders again. The leader very helpfully told me on the 9th of March that she and her noble friend Lord True had met with all the permanent secretaries to make very clear that the level of service expected from their departments. Um, so I said on the you know, it's 10 years. Uh, let's cut to the chase. It's 10 years since this was looked at. The, the addition of different organisations has still not been done, and there are people all over the country waiting for this to happen because it will affect them and what happens always as well to their pensions. So please, can we get it sorted? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her tenacity and uh, determination on this issue. Um, I will ensure that uh, the relevant Secretary of State and also the Perm Sec uh, of that department has heard her uh, concerns, and I shall uh, ask the Pensions Minister also to contact her. 
Uh, Scott Benton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There have been great strides in the field of low-carbon aviation in recent years, not least the development of hydrogen and electric aircraft. Given these developments, would the Leader of the House consider holding a debate on the role which regional airports such as Blackpool can play in not just improving regional connectivity, but doing so whilst meeting our net zero commitment? Yeah, yeah. Well, the the Honourable Gentleman raises a matter which I know is a concern for, for many people uh, across the House, and uh, that is why we have shown our support for regional airports through the uh, £161 million uh, pound airports and ground uh, operations support scheme uh, that we provided during uh, the pandemic. Uh, but we are very, uh, I know particularly the, the Transport Secretary is very focused on ensuring uh, that we are developing and enabling our very important region, regional connectivity uh, to, uh, to thrive. Uh, he will know how to apply for a debate in, in the usual way. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I wondered if the Leader might be able to help me. Having sat on the Intelligence and Security Committee, I know there are some matters which the Government have to keep secret. But could I suggest that my written parliamentary questions to the Cabinet Office asking uh, how many meetings have been held to discuss the infected blood compensation between different departments, and also asking who chairs those meetings, are of little interest to Vladimir Putin or any other hostile state. So I just wondered whether the leader might be able to help me to get the factual information that I've requested in those written parliamentary questions. I would be very happy to assist the Honourable Lady uh, in, uh, in uh, getting those answers uh, and uh, was aware of that particular situation and have I'm already making inquiries with, uh, with the Cabinet Office with regard to that. I think what the Honourable Lady says is, is true on any issue that's raised uh, in this place, but I think in particular for those victims, uh, those infected and affected by the uh, infected uh, blood uh, scandal, it's doubly important that we have transparency and we demonstrate focus and pace and, uh, and uh, determination to, to get this situation resolved. I will be in touch with her later today. Ben Everett. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm sure you and the, the leader will join me in wishing everybody in Milton Keynes a happy Love Milton Keynes Day yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. But it's not so rosy for some of my constituents, many of them in fact, who are, are fed up with hitting potholes, pothole after pothole on our roads, because the Labour Lib Dem Coalition Council put just £100,000 aside for fixing potholes. So I'm pleased to have secured an extra £1.1 million from the government on top of the £2.8 million per year the council already gets to fix potholes on MK's roads from the government. Is it time for yet another debate on potholes in this place? And will my right honourable friend join me in urging the council to stop wasting millions of pounds of taxpayers' cash and use this money to end the plague of potholes in Milton Keynes. Well, happy I Love Milton Keynes Day to, uh, to everyone uh, celebrating that. Um, I, I don't think, actually, the, the residents of Milton Keynes should love their council, though, by the sounds of it. Um, potholes are uh, a, a blight on, uh, on the motorist, and that's why we're investing uh, 200 million uh, in maintaining and improving uh, roads and filling in those potholes. I do understand that his council have spent 11 million on placing moss uh, on the uh, council uh, town hall's uh, walls, uh, as this is a bizarre priority they seem to have, and has provided uh, no upside to the public other than perhaps providing an amusing metaphor for the most undynamic council uh, that, uh, that that place has seen. Uh, Dr Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. A, a constituent of mine discovered in November that HMRC had handed over £972 to the company Mortgage Smiths, who took almost half of that in commission fees. As he hadn't commissioned this company in the first place, he demanded to see 
the application form, which was such a poor forgery that both his and his wife's signature were clearly in the same handwriting. With the government repeatedly warning the public not to fall for financial scams, it's incredible that the HMRC fell for this one. So can we have a Treasury statement so we can understand the extent of this problem, what's being done to prevent it in the future, and when constituents like mine will actually get their money from the HMRC? Well, I, I thank the, the, the Honourable Lady for raising this case. I'm very sorry to uh, hear that. Um, she may, of course, wish to raise it at Treasury questions on the 9th of May, um, but given this is a sizeable chunk of money for, for them to be out of pocket with, I will certainly raise this today uh, with, with HMRC and uh, ask them to uh, contact the Honourable Lady with regard to this case. Elaine Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The government committed to bring forward a consultation into the regulation of rehoming activities for animal sanctuaries and rehoming organisations this year. Dogs Trust, who operate in my constituency, are keen that this should take place. Might my right honourable friend grant government time for a debate on this issue or advise other ways to expedite this consultation, as I know other colleagues will be as concerned as I am by the possible mistreatment of dogs in non-regulated establishments and the effect that they are having on legitimate rehoming centres who do such fantastic work? Yeah. Yeah. Can I thank my honourable friend for all the work that she has done uh, championing this particular issue and also in the support for the Dogs Trust, which do a, a huge amount of good work in this area. Area. She will know that the action plan for animal welfare includes commitments to pursuing the licensing of uh, animal sanctuaries, rescue and rehoming centres for, for cats, dogs and, and horses. Uh, and I will certainly make sure that uh, the, uh, the department has, uh, has heard her concerns today. Uh, Rachel Mascot. Thank you, yeah, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Residents of Acom and Westfield were hopeful at York's 5.8 million Shared Prosperity Fund award for much needed regeneration, but then horrified to wake up to find that 400,000 of it had been squandered on a half paved high street barricaded by 136 bollards. Can we have a statement on how government is scrutinising this much-needed fund, as York residents want to know why York's Lib Dem and Green councillors have been allowed to waste even more public funding on a barricade of bollards? Well, I'm sorry to, uh, to hear that. Uh, she will know that... Uh, uh, as well as uh, the, the checks and balances in place for awarding this funding, uh, there are uh, evaluation works that, that go on, and I, um, I'm sorry uh, that that is not delivering a, a better impact for, for her local residents. I shall make sure that the uh, levelling up department have, have heard her concerns, as the next questions isn't until the 5th of June, um, and I would just encourage uh, the, the local authority to make sure that uh, with the sizeable chunk of money that they have secured, uh, that they're doing something worthwhile with it. Uh, Giles Watling. We'll like you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, yesterday, uh, I attended a very touching uh, moment at the Cenotaph when we were marking the 108th um, anniversary of the genocide in Armenia. That poor benighted country has shrunk over many, many years and decades. And now there is a, an ongoing fight that's been going on for decades as well in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And there is the Lachin Corridor, which is being ineffectively policed by Russian so-called peacekeepers. There are 120,000 people there who are, are undernourished and are not getting supplies through. Um, and I think we should have government time for a debate on this issue, if at all possible. Thank you. Leader of the House. Well, uh, he will not have long to be presented with an opportunity to, to raise this uh, with the, uh, the Foreign Secretary as uh, the next questions is, uh, is on the 2nd of uh, May. Uh, he is, uh, I'm very pleased that he was able to uh, attend that uh, debate and I think actually Parliament will shortly have uh, uh, an inward visit uh, from uh, Armenia as well uh, in, the, in the not too distant future. Uh, but I shall make sure the Department has, has heard him and encourage him to attend on Tuesday. Uh, Vera Baird. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Not a week goes by without high-profile sexual harassment allegations in the workplace hitting the headlines. The CBI is just the latest example. My private member's bill to protect workers from harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace has cross-party and, crucially, government support. It passed all stages in, the house, in this House and was expected to pass unopposed through the House of Lords. However, three rebels in the other place tabled amendments and the bill is now stuck. The government has assured me of their continued support and are working hard to find a solution. If such a solution to the impasse is found, we will need a small amount of extra time in this place to resolve the remaining stages of this bill. Will the Leader of the House support me in finding this extra time with the government whips so that this important bill to protect workers from harassment and sexual harassment in the workplace can pass into law? Leader of the House. Well, the Honourable Lady uh, will know, yes, we, we are supporting uh, the bill, and she will also know that discussions are ongoing uh, and that ministers are engaging uh, with uh, their lordships uh, and others who have raised concerns. Uh, and she can have my assurance that uh, the business managers uh, will, are very alive to, to this matter uh, and uh, will do all we can to uh, ensure that uh, these important measures are, are, being, are able to be brought forward. Simon Baines. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could my right honourable friend facilitate a debate about greater restrictions on off-road motorcycling, which is causing huge problems in my constituency, particularly in the rural lanes and communities, and particularly in the Carrier Valley, and it is being caused by people who are coming from miles away but leaving the council taxpayers of Wrexham to pick up the bill for the repairs to the roads. Leader of the House. Well, I'm sorry to, to hear that situation. Most uh, issues concerned with uh, green laning uh, do stem from uh, illegal use, and they are a matter for enforcement uh, with by the, the local police. Uh, we have provided the police, local authorities and other agencies with uh, a number of powers and tools they can use to, to respond quickly uh, to that kind of uh, antisocial behaviour and to reduce the, the environmental impacts uh, that he describes. The next DEFRA questions are on the 25th of May and the next Home Office questions are on the uh, 22nd of May and I hope the Honourable Gentleman will make use of both opportunities to raise this case. Charlotte Nichols. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the two years since this government recklessly disbanded the Industrial Strategy Council, other economies which have a more proactive approach to decarbonisation, the role of artificial intelligence and automation, and sciences like genomics and cyber are fast overtaking us. We're not just not a world leader in technologies we should and could be, but we're barely even a world follower at this point, with countries like Sweden showcasing to the Bayes Committee in recent weeks fully zero-carbon steel and battery gigafactories at commercial scale that we have no realistic pathway to even begin work on in this country. When will we see some substantial government time for horizon scanning for an industrial strategy fit for the future, instead of tinkering around the edges as we get left further behind? Well, I Leader would have... disagree with the, the Honourable Lady's uh, description of what is going on in those particular growth sectors. And I would point her to the machinery of government changes the Prime Minister uh, instigated to ensure that uh, science and tech is given the right profile uh, in Whitehall. Uh, the, uh, the Minister for Science is currently uh, touring uh, the UK, going to these uh, uh, new clusters to see uh, what more we can do to really ensure we're, we're making use of, uh, of every opportunity. And uh, she will know that the next questions to that department are next week, and I would encourage her to, uh, to ask for more information from the team. Simon Fell. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Local staff in BBC Radio Cumbria are rightly concerned about the proposals to slash services. Hours of content are planned to go, as is our only full-time journalist, and morale in the team is at rock bottom. At best, the plans put forward by the BBC will mean that the popular drive time show is more likely to cover Accrington than Ascom, and at the weekend, when people tune into the breakfast show, it will cover Manchester, Liverpool, Cumbria and Lancashire. I struggle to see what is local about that. 
This is the BBC turning its back on local communities like those in Barrow and Furness. Would my right honourable friend agree to a debate in government time so that members across the House can share their views about the shadow of the service that the BBC seems to want to leave behind? Well, this is an important matter my honourable friend raises. Uh, local broadcasting is not just vital to a community in terms of getting messages and, uh, and news out and strengthening that community. It's also a vital tool to protect democracy as well. And uh, I can understand why the honourable gentleman has raised that today and why he's working so hard to, to make sure that the BBC really understands the impact of some of these changes. I think it will be an excellent topic for a debate. The concerns will be shared by many members of this House, and I'd encourage him to apply for a debate in the usual way. Martin Doherty Hughes. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Backbench Business Committee rightfully mentions and highlights International Workers Memorial Day tomorrow, where we commemorate those who we lost who have due to injury or death in the workplace or to their job, including the former and now late member for Halifax who died due to a malignant mesothelioma, attributed, I don't know if the leader knows, to in part by the coroner exposure to asbestos in this very house. So I wonder if the Leader of the House agrees with Clydebank Asbestos Group, with the Western Berkshire Joint Trade Union Group, the STUC and TUC, that building on the commemorations tomorrow, that we now make time in government time to debate and vote to enhance workers' safety across these islands. Well, I thank the Honourable House. Gentleman again for, um, uh, for raising this important uh, Memorial Day and, uh, and the sad case that, uh, that he refers to. Uh, it is obviously, uh, with regard to this House, uh, a huge concern to the Commission uh, and those in the other place as we consider proposals for uh, restoration and renewal programmes for, uh, for this building. Uh, and uh, certainly I shall make sure that uh, the relevant departments have heard uh, what the uh, Honourable Gentleman has said. Uh, he will know how to apply for a debate in the, uh, in the many ways that he has, but given that the Chairman of the, the Backbench uh, Business Committee has also raised this issue, uh, that might be the first port of call for him. Mark Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, a number of constituents have written to me in recent weeks pointing out that fuel prices at forecourts in my constituency seem to be both higher than other uh, forecourts of the same brands uh, in nearby stations, and also the prices seem to drop at a slower rate uh, than nearby stations. Now, I have previously written to Tesco's about their uh, forecourt in Clown, and they have said that they determine the cost of fuel based on the price set by near by four courts, but as my constituency runs alongside the M1, there are two service stations within those nearby forecourts which artificially increase the fuel prices, and it's in a rural area. So can we have a debate on the, the cost of fuel and whether fuel providers are actually passing on the benefits of falling fuel, fuel prices or are actually benefiting and profiteering off rural and poorer constituencies. Well, this, is an, this is an incredibly important issue and I know is a concern to, to many people across the country. Uh, campaigns uh, run by, for example, Fair Fuel that are calling for Pump Watch, the fact that uh, that initiative is supported by uh, The Sun uh, and, uh, and other media shows that their, their readers and uh, um, uh, viewers and listeners are very concerned about ensuring that there is fairness uh, going on at the pump. The government welcomes the Competition and Markets Authority's decision to investigate uh, this matter, and carefully we will consider any recommendations that, uh, that they make. Uh, but it is very important to ensure that companies and individual motorists uh, are not uh, being overcharged and that there is fairness uh, in that system. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. The Leader may well be surprised to learn that her Cabinet colleague, the Secretary of State for Transport, is named as being legally responsible in the Environmental Protection Act uh, 1989 for keeping England's roads on the strategic road network clean from litter 
and tipping. I say she might be surprised by that because some of the dirtiest roads in the country are those that are operated by national highways, including the M67 and M60 through my constituency. I reported the state of cleanliness uh, on those roads to national highways to be told that they were judged to be, uh, to be judged grade B, which meant that no action was required. They are utterly filthy. They would be grade D at best if the local authority had judged these roads. What's the Secretary of State going to do uh, to reassure members of this House, can we have a statement on cleanliness of Highways England, National Highways Roads? Well, this is an important matter Need that the, the Honourable Gentleman has uh, raised, and I shall make sure the Department has, uh, has heard his concerns, given that uh, next questions is not until uh, June. Uh, there are clearly statutory duties that, uh, that uh, certain organisations have. Uh, these things are also best solved in partnership as well uh, with local authorities, and I know that uh, that is what local councils uh, do. Uh, but I will make sure that the Secretary of State has heard what he has said. Drew Hendry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I underline the importance of International Workers Memorial Day and the need for reflection on those killed, injured, made disabled or unwell? For my part, I will be attending uh, with the Inverness Trades Council and others a memorial to reflect on those who are killed through their service to others during their work, as well as at a rally on Saturday. But can we have a debate in government time on the need for further protection for workers to give the government the opportunity to change tack and support those enhancements? Well, I we thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman, the, the third member today, to, to raise this important Memorial Day, and I, I certainly hope the event he is attending goes, uh, goes well. As I have said before, I shall make sure that the, uh, the, depart the relevant departments, as there are more than one, uh, focused on these matters, have heard uh, that members have raised this matter today. Emily about Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker, Daniel Futas from South Shields committed suicide last year whilst on leave from a mental health hospital under Cumbria Northumberland in Tynemwea NHS Foundation Trust. Daniel's inquest found that appropriate precautions were not in place to prevent him from doing so. The coroner subsequently sent the Trust a Regulation 28 report to prevent future deaths with recommendations for improvement. The Trust disagree with the coroner's findings and are not obligated to act on them. Can we please have an urgent debate on the effectiveness of Regulation 28 reports? Yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady raises a, a very important matter, and uh, I will certainly make sure that the uh, Secretary of State has heard uh, her concerns. Uh, it is a matter I've heard other members uh, raise with, with particular uh, regard uh, to, uh, to that provision, and uh, she will know how to apply for a debate in the usual way, um, perhaps through the, the offices of the, uh, the APPG. Carol Monaghan. This week is the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster, where um, 1,130 garment workers in Bangladesh were killed when the factory collapsed. Now, union workers had to dig through the rubble to find what labels were involved. And it was found that brands sourcing UK shops, such as Primark, Mango, Matalan and Benetton, were but some of them. Um, many countries are moving to a situation where companies in, their, in the country have responsibility for supply chains. So can we have a debate in government time about the need for legislation to bring strong legal frameworks for corporate accountability? Leader of the House. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for uh, bringing uh, to our attention that uh, that terrible and sad uh, event and the the tenth anniversary of it, she will know that uh, 
both the, um, the uh, FCDO uh, has done a huge amount of work in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, those, those issues uh, are the likelihood of them happening again are reduced by working to have good practices in garment factories uh, uh, across countries that we work with. We have also introduced a number of measures working with the UN to strengthen transparency in supply chains, but she is absolutely right, there has to be accountability for that, and I shall make sure that uh, uh, on the front bench is the, uh, the Foreign Secretary, uh, but also to make sure uh, that uh, um, uh, our uh, Department for Business is also very focused on the issues that the Honourable Lady raises. Uh, Clive Effort. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Immigration Minister at the dispatch box used the figure of 460,000 to claim that uh, that's what the government inherited from the last Labour government in a backlog of asylum claims. Now, using figures supplied to him by the Immigration Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Rhonda has been able to demonstrate that that figure is fewer than 19,000. So shouldn't the Immigration Minister come back to the dispatch box under the minister, as required by the Ministerial Code and correct the record? So what can the leader do to ensure that the record is corrected either today or first thing when we return after the weekend? Um, I Thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising this matter. He knows that he can raise this in points of order, um, but uh, I have to say I don't, uh, I don't recognise the figures that uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, raises. Clearly, if a minister hasn't uh, uh, given the correct uh, figures at the dispatch box, uh, ministers do uh, correct uh, the record, uh, and, uh, and that is what should happen. Um, but I, I personally don't think that is uh, the, the situation in this case. And what I think we should all be focused on in this place is ensuring that we can take forward the legislation that this government is proposing so we can strengthen and make more effective the systems that deal with these very vulnerable people. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. If the Leader of the House really is keen on debates on the government's record on sewage, I hope she'll timetable some more in government time, because then we could point out that after 13 years of Tory government, with falling real wages and the shocking state of our rivers, we've gone from the affluent society under Labour to the effluent society under the Tories. Um, well, very, very uh, droll, um, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I, my only reluctance to, uh, to have a debate uh, where we could compare um, uh, the Labour Party's record in government with our record in government on this matter is that I wouldn't be able to take part in it because when I took uh, um, the seat from uh, my seat from Labour in 2010, raw sewage was running through the households on Portsdown Hill and through their gardens. It was contaminating land that uh, animals grazed on, uh, threatening their health. We had, despite being the only island city in the UK. We didn't have any effective sea defences. We had major flooding. In the investment that's gone into my constituency, which is in excess of, of hundreds of millions of pounds, we now have beautiful sea defences that are not just protecting uh, the insurance payers of uh, Portsmouth, but also promoting biodiversity. We've new pumping stations. We've repaired the damage, damage to the uh, to the, su the sewage system, and by 2030, we, uh, we now have all storm overflows monitored. It was just 6% uh, when I uh, took over the seat, and by 2030, we will have eliminated storm overflows from the Solent. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the House may not know that the Royal Mint, which makes all of the coins in circulation across the UK, is proudly located in my constituency. The Royal Mint is a key local employer, and we must ensure a sustainable future for highly skilled jobs in Llantrisant, particularly in our circulating coin industry, given the rapid rise to a cashless society. Now, can the Leader of the House please help me to secure a meeting with her colleague, the Economic Secretary of the Treasury, to discuss this further? Yeah. House. Well, thank, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question, but also to uh, affords me the opportunity to say thank you to uh, her constituents, because the Royal Mint have been uh, very busy uh, recently uh, for, uh, for various reasons. Thank, uh, I thank them for, uh, for their role in the important events uh, that, are, that are coming up. I would be very happy uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Secretary has heard her uh, uh, her request for uh, a meeting and do what I can to facilitate that. Um, but she will also know that uh, the relevant questions are on the 9th of May, so she will not have long to wait for that. 
Margaret Ferry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This week, I was to meet with the Minister for Energy, Consumers and Affordability to discuss long-standing Green Deal casework. Two hours before the meeting, it was cancelled and no replacement meeting was offered until the Right Honourable Lady promptly stepped in. This is not the first time Ministers have cancelled meetings on this issue. Will the Leader of the House schedule a debate in Government time on the lack of adequate support for unresolved Helms Green Deal cases? Leader of the House. Um, well, I'm sorry to have heard about this situation, and uh, the Honourable Lady kindly mentions that uh, I've already uh, intervened on this matter. Uh, I do know that the reason why the uh, minister did cancel was due to votes and a Westminster Hall debate that they were involved in. Um, but I know, and they've reiterated today, they are very keen to meet with the uh, with the honourable uh, lady, and I will ensure that uh, that that does in fact take place. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can um, just on Tuesday past, an Orthodox church in Ukraine's Kherson region was destroyed by a guided bomb. The church became one of hundreds of churches destroyed by Russian strikes, but significantly, according to President Zelensky, just quoted this week, the use of such munitions shows a new development of deliberate targeting of churches by Russia. An attack by, those, uh, by Russia on religious belief, an attack upon the right to hold those religious beliefs, and as Chair of the APPG of Freedom of Religious Belief, I take this opportunity to bring it to the attention of the House, and in particular to the Leader of the House, to see what we can do. So will the Leader of the House help facilitate a meeting with the Minister to discuss the impact of this has on freedom of religion and belief. Thank you. Leader of the House. Well, I, th I thank the, the Honourable Gentleman for raising this appalling uh, case. Uh, churches, places of worship are never legitimate targets uh, uh, in, uh, in conflict situations. Uh, it is further evidence, I'm afraid, of the appalling atrocities and war crimes uh, that, that Russia is waging uh, against civilians in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, I thank him for, for drawing the House's attention to it today. And we'll certainly make sure that uh, ministers have heard what he has said. I thank the uh, Leader of the House for the business statement. Uh, statement, Foreign Secretary. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. With permission, I will make a statement to the House on the situation in Sudan. Thirteen days ago, intense fighting broke out in Khartoum. The conflict quickly spread across the country and was being waged on residential streets in Omdurman, El Fasher, in Darfur, as well as in Sudanese cities, until a US-led ceasefire was, accept was accepted by both sides. Uh, I'm proud that we uh, contributed to calling for uh, that ceasefire, and we will continue to do our utmost to secure a lasting peace. But I remind the House that we anticipate that the ceasefire will end tonight, midnight, local Sudanese time. I take this opportunity to commend the hard work of officials from across government and the military, not only on the ground in Sudan, but also those who have been working day and night in our crisis response centre in the FCDO. Their extraordinary efforts have uh, been an inspiration to me and all those who have taken uh, the opportunity to visit them over the last few days. The struggle for power between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support force has killed hundreds of Sudanese citizens and threatens to claim the lives, sadly, of many more. This is a monumental tragedy, one with the potential to destabilise not just Sudan, but the wider region. It is therefore in our interests, and more importantly in the interests of the people of Sudan, to secure a peaceful and sustainable settlement as quickly as possible. However, our ability and the ability of all outside powers to determine the course of events within Sudan is limited. What is within our power is the safe extraction of as many British nationals as practically possible. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to confirm to the House that the supported departure of British nationals uh, facilitated by the UK from Sudan uh, started on Tuesday. As of yesterday evening, six flights carrying over, uh, carrying three carrying 536 people had landed safely in Cyprus. 
More flights continue today, so that number is rising, uh, and I will ensure that I find uh, the opportunity to give updates uh, to the House. A ceasefire is due to elapse at midnight local time, and no one, no one can predict the situation on the ground after that. We are pushing those, uh, sorry, we are encouraging those who wish to travel to make their way to the airport today. We will continue to engage with our international partners to attempt to extend the ceasefire and bring a permanent end to the violence. And I will, of course, keep the House updated on developments on that front. For those on the ground, as you would expect, we are prioritising those in greatest need through allocating seats based on vulnerability, uh, starting with families with children, uh, the elderly, the disabled or people with documented medical conditions. We have been notifying British nationals registered with us about the, uh, about the evacuation flights, as well as announcing them through our travel advice and also through uh, organic social media networks of British nationals in Sudan. We are working with the Home Office, UK Border Force and the FCO, FCDO staff on the ground to facilitate clearances for those boarding the flights and we will continue to coordinate intensively with our international partners. Several countries without a diplomatic presence in Sudan have, re have requested that we assist their nationals. We are energetically exploring options on how best to do this without compromising our duty to British nationals. Mr Deputy Speaker, a ceasefire is not necessarily a prelude to peace, and the situation could deteriorate over the coming days. We will continue to support British nationals, which is why we have established a temporary presence in Port Sudan on the Red Sea coast, and have put consular officials on the border points in Egypt, Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia. Mr Deputy Speaker, Sudan is the third largest country in Africa. It is more than 800 miles from the capital to Aswan in uh, Egypt and over 500 miles from Khartoum to the Red Sea. Even if there wasn't a war, Sudan's vastness makes logistics of moving large numbers of people extraordinarily challenging. We are aware of a number of British nationals who have now left Sudan by other means, including some that were able to join evacuations led by our international partners. We are working with our diplomatic missions in the country where they are uh, where we are working with our diplomatic missions in the countries where they are arriving to provide consular assistance where required. Mr Deputy Speaker, although we are making every effort to evacuate our nationals, peace in Sudan will also be a key objective. We call on both sides to end the killing for the sake of the people of Sudan. They have already suffered enough after decades of civil war. We are pursuing all diplomatic avenues to end the violence and de-escalate tension. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, the Defence Secretary, the Minister for Development and I are in regular touch with our international partners. The role of the Africa Union, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development and our partners in the region, in the Gulf and beyond will, of course, be critical. Mr Deputy Speaker, the United Kingdom has profound ties and a historic friendship with the people of Sudan. We stand in solidarity with them and their right to demand a peaceful and democratic future and a return to civilian rule. When conditions allow, the UK is ready to join international efforts to rebuild the Sudanese economy and ease human suffering. This will not be easy, but it is vital for the region and, of course, for Sudan that we try. We will bring as many of our nationals as possible to safety, and we can and will play a pivotal, pivotal part in rebuilding of that great and ancient country. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Foreign Secretary for advance sight of his statement and the briefings that he and his officials have provided. The ceasefire announced on Monday night opened a crucial window to evacuate UK nationals and to pause the needless bloodshed. I'd like to place on record Labour's sincere thanks to our brave armed forces and tireless FCDO staff. None of us doubt the complexity of the very challenging circumstances of this operation, 
The whole House sincerely hopes for its success. And we welcome that more than 500 UK nationals have now boarded planes out of Sudan. But just hours of this ceasefire remain. 500 is only a quarter of those we know have registered with the FCDO. And the true number of British citizens in Sudan is closer to 4,000. Amid the very welcome stories of families reunited, there are tales of real concern. Those unable to reach the airfield because of violence on the route. Patchy official communications. British citizens travelling hours over land only to find the borders closed. Mr Deputy Speaker, yesterday the Times reported a British doctor is stuck at home with a bullet wound in his leg and dwindling supplies of antibiotics. After the government rejected his 86-year-old mother's request for a temporary visa. It's not right that British nationals are unable to leave because their close Sudanese family members are being excluded from safe passage, especially as we know that planes have left the airfield without being full. Can I urge the Foreign Secretary to take swift action to ensure that British citizens can travel with their family now? Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, we all hope this ceasefire will hold, but there is every chance it will not. How confident is the Foreign Secretary that all who want to be evacuated will be by the time the ceasefire expires at midnight? What are the prospects of an extension? And will flights continue tomorrow anyway? And what planning is underway to create alternative routes out of the country should fighting return to Khartoum? Mr Deputy Speaker, in the coming weeks, the government will face legitimate questions about its handling of the crisis. Germany was running the Wadi Sayy Idna airfield after the UK's initial diplomatic evacuation operation was completed and stood down. The Germans managed to evacuate 700 people with 30 countries before our evacuation of UK nationals had properly begun. Why did other countries choose to evacuate nationals straight away without a ceasefire in place when we chose not to? And why were both the ambassador and the deputy ambassador reportedly out of the country when fighting broke out? Why are Hercules aircraft that have now been used in two airlifts in two, two years still set to be scrapped? And the elephant in the room here, which lessons of the Afghan evacuation have been learned and properly implemented? The immediate priority of the British government is rightly to ensure that as many UK nationals as possible can leave quickly and safely. But we must not allow the world's gaze to turn away from Sudan once foreign nationals have left. Sudan is at risk of lurching into deeper crisis its people did not make or deserve. They face the threat of intense fighting, dwindling supplies of food and water, and a wider humanitarian catastrophe. And as I heard firsthand on my visit to Kenya this week, there is real concern that fighting could bubble over and cross over into borders, amplifying this conflict and human suffering. So while we press the government on the vital efforts to support British nationals abroad, we will continue to press for action to end the bloodshed against the people of Sudan and the wider region. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, can I uh, thank the Right Honourable uh, Gentleman, particularly for the uh, kind and thoughtful words that he has expressed about uh, the uh, military and the other officials who are on the ground uh, supporting the British, British nationals uh, through his uh, evacuation. Uh, and I also uh, commend him for the, uh, the, the tone that he has taken with regards to uh, pushing the government, quite rightly holding us to account, uh, but also being constructive and supportive in, in terms of what is ultimately our first priority, which is the protection and evacuation of British nationals uh, where possible. Um, he, he spoke about communications, he's right to do so. Communications with British nationals in Sudan remains a significant challenge. The mobile phone network is inconsistent and often down. The internet, uh, likewise. We have utilised multiple channels, including uh, telephone calls, SMS messaging, but also cascading information through organically created WhatsApp groups that pre-existed uh, the, uh, the conflict. But I uh, would say to him and the, and the House, that communications remain a huge challenge. 
This touches upon uh, his questions about the total number of British nationals uh, in Sudan. The UK does not routinely request British nationals to uh, inform us when they are overseas. We did so when this conflict uh, started, but it, just as it is very difficult for us to communicate with British nationals in Sudan, it is very, very difficult in many cases for them to communicate back to us. So we know that a number will have made their own arrangements for leaving Sudan. It is not possible for us to have an accurate assessment of how many have done so at this point. We hope to do so as they get in contact with us from third countries. Um, and we will uh, continue to push information in whatever ways we can to the people that we are seeking to help uh, in country. With regard to uh, an extension of the ceasefire, we are pushing hard for that and we are um, uh, amplifying the voices of those in the region and more widely that this is in the best interest of Sudan and I would say here at the dispatch box for either of the generals who might be watching this um, uh, statement that if they aspire to be the leader of Sudan demonstrating a willingness to protect the people of Sudan would be a very important uh, starting point and we will continue to push however however it is almost impossible for us to predict whether there will be an extension and what the circumstances might be like if the extension uh, uh, does not happen. We will endeavour to keep evacuating people through the airhead in Wadi Siedna, but we cannot guarantee our ability to do so. We are, explore, we are exploring the, and, uh, the support to other routes, which is why we've set up a, a temporary presence at Port Sudan and why we have officials at the border in the uh, neighbouring countries. Uh, he asked a couple of specific questions about, um, uh, about members of staff who were in the uh, embassy at the time when uh, the conflict uh, started. Uh, the head of mission, our ambassador, was out of the country at the time. However, we have a well-established uh, chain of command passing on uh, process and the, the formal number two in the embassy was in command and control of the embassy when this initiated. And in fact, uh, the fact the ambassador was able to plug into the crisis response centre into the UK was actually uh, invaluable. And he asked specifically about C-130 Hercules. The simple truth is they are an old airframe. There are newer and better aircraft which will be replacing the functions uh, of those. And finally, he is absolutely right that in parallel with our evacuation op uh, um, uh, operations, we have to work on the immediate and long-term stability of Sudan, uh, make every effort to pretend, pre uh, prevent this conflict spilling over into neighbouring countries and destabilising the region. We will continue to do so. Foreign Affairs Secretary Chair. Thank Policy. you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I also place on record my gratitude to the Foreign Office staff, those on the rapid deployment teams, those in the crisis centre, our armed forces and border force. But can I also point out how unacceptable it is that some media have been outside the homes of civil servants who are not senior civil servants, not just their homes, their parents' homes. This is utterly unacceptable, and I would urge the Foreign Office to make clear to the media that this cannot continue. Moving back to the crisis on the ground, when the ceasefire was agreed, the clock began for how we would make sure that hostilities did not return from midnight to night. What reassurances can my honourable friend give me that we will not see Westerners removed and Sudanese left to face appalling violence. The point was made just now about our criteria for evacuation. Can I urge my right honourable friend to please review this? The reality is that children we treat as dependents, but very elderly sick parents should also be treated as dependents. And on the specific case that was just raised, the family have made their way to the airstrip after my suggestion they travelled. The NHS doctor has had to receive emergency medical treatment at the airstrip under local anaesthesia because of how advanced the infection was following his having been shot. He has not been allowed on the flight that departed uh, about three minutes ago because he wanted to take his mother with him. I urge the government we have the ability to change the criteria. The Home Office and the Foreign Office, I can't quite determine who's determining the criteria at the moment. That was a key recommendation from Afghanistan. Please can we recognise that dependents are also the elderly and not just the young. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm very grateful uh, for my honourable friend echoing the words of support of our officials both on the ground and at home. It is completely inappropriate that people who have dedicated their, uh, their lives to public service 
and have operated through incredibly intense situations are uh, hounded by the press uh, in this way and I would call upon responsible journalism uh, in all respects. Um, I, I, I very much um, recognise that she has personal experience of some of the complexities of consular work uh, from her uh, life before uh, politics and I of course always listen very carefully uh, to the uh, suggestions and recommend recommendations she makes. I know uh, that they are all done uh, with a genuine desire to improve the situation. There is a real challenge um, about extending the criteria for who we evacuate. We are instinctively uh, desiring to be as generous as possible, but of course we do need to ensure that we discharge our primary duty to British uh, nationals and the traditionally recognised uh, dependents. I understand the point she make, makes about uh, more elderly um, members of the family. Uh, and of course, we will look at what we can do to be as supportive uh, as possible. Uh, and with regards to uh, how many uh, others we may be able to take, of course, this is entirely dependent, as I said to the right honourable gentleman a few moments ago, to whether we can get the ceasefire to stick and our ability to continue the evacuation if the ceasefire collapses. We will, of course, keep all these decisions under review at the regular COBRA meetings uh, that we have. SNP spokesman, Drew Henry. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Foreign Secretary for advance sight of his statement. He's absolutely right that uh, we must do everything we can to ensure a lasting peace. He's also right to praise the performance of the uh, men and women of the armed forces and others who have facilitated evacuations so far, but time is of the essence. The Minister for Africa said on TV last night, we cannot guarantee how many further flights will depart once the ceasefire ends. He added, we hope there will be enough capacity to get them all out. With the numbers arriving at evacuation points doubling or even trebling uh, at the moment, why are they relying on hope rather than action? The Minister for Africa also admitted on TV, when asked about safe and legal routes for Sudanese refugees, that they, and I quote, don't exist. So will the Foreign Secretary comment on that? And what is the current status of how many people have fled into Sudan, uh, fled Sudan into neighbouring countries to escape the violence? Bordering countries such as Ethiopia, Chad, the Central African Republic have already become politically insecure. So what are his plans to ensure that people fleeing here will be safeguarded? Here, here. Mr Speaker, my right hon. Friend, the, uh, the African Minister, the Development Minister, is absolutely right that we will endeavour to continue to support British nationals in their evacuation once the, once the uh, or if the ceasefire is not uh, extended. Uh, we are one of only three nations in the world that have established an airhead in the vicinity of Khartoum to facilitate uh, uh, air evacuations. Uh, we, the French, the Germans, the only three countries in the world that have done so, and that has allowed our our aircraft and the aircraft of a wide number of other countries to airlift their nationals out. However, 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 no one can guarantee what will happen when the ceasefire comes to an end. With regard to, uh, with regard to the wider uh, push of refugees because of this conflict, I would remind him and the House that Sudan is not the only live conflict uh, in the world. I know it is in the forefront of many, many people's minds, and therefore uh, it is completely legitimate that he asks questions specifically about it. The gentleman stops interrupting. You might hear that I will answer his questions. We will, we will now, that the, now the illegal migration bill has, despite his attempts to thwart it, gone through uh, the parliamentary stages here in the Commons, we will be, as we have promised, establishing safe and legal, legal routes. That will be as part of our plan to control illegal migration, and further details will come through. And with regard to preventing regional instability, we remain very closely aligned with the Africa Union uh, and uh, our partners in the region, with whom I speak regularly, to try and ensure that this conflict uh, does not escalate and does not spill over into neighbouring countries. Thank you, 
Mr Deputy Speaker, this country will always play its part in providing sanctuary to those who are fleeing from war. May I thank the government for its actions in Sudan to date. Is my right honourable friend able to confirm that the UK is indeed the fourth largest recipient of individuals from Sudan through those routes operated by the UNHCR and that these routes will remain open for as long as feasibly possible? My honourable friend makes an incredibly important point. This country has a long-standing reputation and tradition of uh, hospitality and generosity to those fleeing individual persecution uh, or violence from uh, around the world. And we have demonstrated that time and time and time again. And there have been tens of thousands of people who have come to the UK using safe and legal routes uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the last few years since we've been in government and we will continue to establish safe and legal routes. Our ability to do so will be enhanced by the legislation that he, I and our colleagues voted on last night. I'm grateful constituents have been airlifted out, and I too thank the teams who've worked so hard to do it. But can I raise with the Minister the plight of those stuck because they're awaiting visas, like a constituents' partner who's been in Khartoum for over a year now, waiting for UKVI to handle her visa in the East Africa Processing Centre. She's now had to flee to Uganda, another very dangerous journey. Will the Home Office, you know, will the Minister impress upon the Home Office that their backlog has been pushing people into further dangerous situations? Yeah. Uh, I will ensure that uh, I pass on her concerns. Uh, I, I, I pay tribute to the intense work that Border Force and Home Office uh, staff uh, have done in conjunction with uh, the officials from my department and the Ministry of Defence and others to try and ensure that we uh, facilitate as quick a flow of British nationals and their dependents out of war-torn Sudan, and we will continue to do so. Blackman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I commend my right honourable friend for the progress that he's making and the calm way in which he's operating in a very difficult set of circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, uh, we have a very large number of uh, UK nationals in Sudan at the moment, and it's difficult for them to move around, let alone being able to be airlifted out. What actions is he taking to enable our citizens to get by road or by sea? away from Sudan if that's what they wish to do. Uh, my uh, honourable friend makes an incredibly uh, important point. And one of the challenges that we have is that the uh, travel advice that we give uh, has to enhance the safety of British nationals overseas and not inadvertently put them at a greater risk. Uh, and there is often a lag. There is a lag between us uh, finding out information uh, broadcasting that information and that information acted upon. And one of the things that we have seen, not directly because of advice that the UK has given, but the advice that other governments have given, is that they have inadvertently called people into more dangerous circumstances, and those people have found themselves uh, under attack. So we have to give general advice. Um, we have, uh, we've given the advice that we have the airhead, airhead operating in Wadi Sudnar, we have officials at Port Sudan and we have officials at the border crossing points of nearby uh, countries. We cannot recommend safe routes, we cannot advise on that level of granularity because that advice may well be out of date and therefore counterproductive by the time it is acted upon. Marion Fellows. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Secretary of State confirm what's happening to those visiting Sudan on refugee travel documents? Mm -hmm. And uh, to echo what the Honourable Member for Newport has said, what will actually happen? How long does the uh, Secretary of State estimate it will take to process those people who were actually papers in the uh, consulate in Sudan? Dear, dear. I mean, ultimately, the processing of visas. Uh, is a Home Office function. We are working very closely with the Home Office. I'm not able to give her details of that. The prioritisation that we have broadcast is to discharge our duty to support British nationals and their immediate uh, dependents. I will, of course, make sure that my Home Office uh, colleagues are aware of the question that she put forward. Jerome May. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The FCDO is rightly focusing on the immediate need to evacuate nationals, and for that they have both my thanks and the thanks of, I suspect, everyone in this chamber. But when it's completed, we will leave behind a nation in conflict. So what steps is my right honourable friend taking to galvanise international support, perhaps led by the African Union, to help to end the bloodshed? One second. 
But he, Mr. Deputy Speaker, he is absolutely right. And this, 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 is, uh, this is action which is happening in parallel to our evacuation uh, uh, options. Uh, I have spoken directly or through intermediaries with both. Uh, I've spoken directly with one of the generals and through intermediaries uh, expressed uh, my uh, uh, views to the other. I know that that is action which replicates uh, the actions of our international partners, particularly those in the immediate region who have uh, influence. We must push for peace in Sudan. It is a country that has suffered enough, and we must ensure that it, uh, the conflict that we're now seeing does not spill over into nearby countries. And particularly, we must ensure that malign actors do not interfere in the uh, uh, events in Sudan in order to turn this into a regional conflict. Okay. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can, can I thank the Foreign Secretary for updating the House on what he's trying to do to extract British nationals in what is obviously a very difficult situation? Like my honourable friend for, from Newport East, I'm currently dealing with a case of a constituent whose husband in Sudan has been waiting 13 months for his application to join her on a family reunion visa to be processed. His passport is currently with the British Embassy, who took it as part of the application process. He's now stranded in Sudan, and when my office inquired about the situation, they received the standard reply that there's no time scale for dealing with it. I appreciate the Home Office of the lead department in this situation, but surely we should have concern for all of those people who are in this predicament. I suspect from what we've already heard, there's quite a lot of members going to raise this. Surely we should have concern for all of those people, and we need to know that there's going to be some attention to their situation as well. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as I've said in response to uh, previous questions, obviously uh, the issuing of visas is a Home Office uh, function, but they work in very, very close coordination, of, often uh, physically close to the officials uh, from my department. The ability to issue immediate, uh, 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 the ability to issue uh, temporary travel documents in lieu of a passport uh, is possible. Obviously, I can't comment on the specific details of the case that he raises, but the traditional functions of the Home Office from the FCDO will continue in parallel to this additional function of uh, evacuation, uh, and we will seek to facilitate where they are uh, appropriate and they've uh, um, uh, conformed to the uh, criteria that we set, those reunif reunification visas, which will continue to operate, which is one of the reasons why we've established diplomatic presence, uh, not just in Port Sudan, but in the nearby countries as well. Giles Watling. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for his statement. Um, it's now 10 hours, 45 minutes just under, until this ceasefire ends. So s speed is of the essence. And, and I thank him for the statement about the aircraft that are left taking so many hundreds out. But surely shipborne evacuation would provide us with volume as well. Are there ships going to be going to Port Sudan and elsewhere to get people out of Sudan? Uh, what we have seen, uh, so uh, the short answer is that we uh, have, as a preemptive measure, uh, and this was a decision that was made a number of days ago, diverted uh, a Royal Naval vessel towards uh, Port Sudan. It will not be used. We are not envisaging it being used as, as uh, some kind of uh, a ferry or a relief platform or anything like that. However, it does give us command and control capability. It does give us a, a, a protected platform uh, in the region. And we have also put forward a team of officials from across government to facilitate the onward passage of people who get to Port Sudan. And as I say, we already have diplomatic presence, uh, which has been enhanced in uh, Ethiopia, in Egypt, and across the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much. I just want to put on record how refreshing it is to see the Secretary of State himself here to make the statement. I do hope other departments will follow his lead. There has been a puzzling story uh, put around by German politicians that in some ways our uh, rescue efforts have hampered their own attempts to extract their own citizens. Secondly, there is a story that um, our army did not have permission, our soldiers did not have permission to land in Sudan. Could they 
Foreign Secretary, throw any light on these stories? Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I, I can assure the House that uh, I have a very, very uh, productive uh, bilateral relationship with the, my German opposite number. We speak regularly and we have been in pretty constant uh, text communication throughout this. I want to put on record the huge gratitude that I would like to express uh, to her um, and, and through her to the uh, German uh, military who, uh, who helped to facilitate the evacuation of British nationals and others. We have been working very, very well. The concerns, and I, and I see the concerns that were raised in the press, uh, none of those concerns have been directly raised with me. In the conversations, the regular conversations I have with the Defence Secretary, it is not my understanding that at any point we flew without permissions, and it is not my understanding that that had a negative uh, knock-on effect to uh, others. I will, of course, in the near future, have the opportunity to have an extended conversation with her. If there are any lessons that we need to learn about, uh, about the complexity of operations like this, we will do so. But I can assure him that they have not been raised with me. Alex Seville. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that we all share uh, the deepest concern about the people of Sudan who are suffering this unfolding tragedy, as they've suffered so much tragedy in the last 20 years, and we'll have time in the future to debate why we failed to have a transition to civilian government in Sudan. But we have the immediate issue now of UK citizens trying to, trying to flee. The one uh, question that's not yet been raised about those who are on the land border at Egypt. We know of a number of British and other uh, international um, citizens who are stuck at that land border, some of whom are in acute medical need. What's the Foreign Office doing to facilitate and work with the Egyptian government to make sure they can traverse that land border and uh, seek safety? Um, I, I can assure um, the Honourable Gentleman uh, and the House that I remain in regular contact with my uh, Egyptian uh, opposite number. I have spoken to him directly a number of times uh, during this uh, operation, uh, and as the nature of modern diplomacy, we are on pretty regular uh, uh, text message uh, as well. I know that he ha uh, will have been made aware of the, uh, of the situation at the Sudanese-Egyptian uh, border. Um, I'm planning to speak to him again uh, at some point in the near future, whether today or early part of tomorrow. This will be one of the issues that we discuss. But as I say, we've put forward an enhanced presence, um, uh, an enhanced consular presence from the FCDO in those neighbouring countries to help facilitate cross-border, which are always tricky, particularly during times of conflict, to help facilitate those. Ben Leg. Thank, can I thank the Foreign Secretary for a statement uh, this afternoon? Uh, like many other members, I've been contacted by constituents who are very concerned about friends and close family members who find themselves stuck in this terrible situation out in Sudan. And further to the questions raised by the Honourable Lady, the Chair of the Select Committee, can I just ask whether the Foreign Office is considering uh, reviewing the eligibility criteria, and in particular, whether there is any capacity or consideration given to perhaps those Sudanese uh, passport holders who have entry clearance to the UK, be they students or other uh, individuals, whether there is any capacity of, of evacuating those individuals as well? I thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for, uh, for his, uh, his question and his praise of the work that the officials across government have done in this. Um, I, I don't want to preempt any decisions by COBRA. We will, of course, look at the criteria. We've kept the criteria constantly under review to ensure that we were able to discharge our duty uh, to support uh, British nationals, which, of course, is the uh, primary duty uh, of the government. I, I would make the broader point that if we were to change the eligi eligibility, we would need to do so in a non-discriminatory way. So we wouldn't necessarily be able to say Sudanese people who, it would just need to be foreign nationals who, and that could potentially create a, uh, 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 an unsustainable uh, degree uh, of uh, demand for evacuations that we might not be able to address. But we, we always look at these things uh, very, very carefully. We want to make sure that we uh, discharge not just our duty to British nationals, but we remain uh, as we have been a, 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 a generous at heart nation. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, on the point of safe and legal routes, of course there are no safe and legal routes for people to uh, come to the United Kingdom. And in fact, in, twen in 2022, uh, the Sudanese were amongst the fifth, the five highest ni nationalities who travelled in small boats across the Channel. Now, in light of what's happening, has the Foreign Secretary had any conversations with the Home Secretary about establishing safe and legal routes 
in light of this particular crisis and also in light of the vote last night on the Illegal Migration Bill, which means that anyone arriving in the United Kingdom after March the 7th, irregularly, which people in small boats will be counted as, will be detained and uh, sent to a third country, which I assume the government would say is Rwanda. Um, I think the Honourable uh, Lady meant that there are no current safe and legal routes established from Sudan. In her question, it, it implied that there, she, she said there were no safe and legal routes, and of course there are. There, there are many, specifically in Sudan. As I say, I would make the point Sudan is not the only conflict zone uh, in the world. The bill that was voted on last night has uh, an explicit commitment to establish safe and legal routes in parallel to ensuring that those people. Uh, who come here uh, illegally are, are uh, administrat uh, administrated quickly, fairly um, and uh, efficiently, and it's right that we do uh, both. It, uh, ultimately, it will be a, a government decision led by the Home Office with input from other departments such as mine in terms of establishing those safe and legal routes, and this is a discussion that we will, in, uh, of course, have. Margaret Ferry. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement. Reports have shown that fake Twitter accounts are impersonating key players in this conflict and are being legitimised by the recently introduced subscription service on the platform. One tweet falsely reporting the death of the RSF leader gained over one million views before being removed. What consideration has there been for the role that social media plays in spreading misinformation? about this conflict, putting lives and operations at risk as a result. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady raises an incredibly important point. I, I, I cannot express the level of frustration I have with what seems to be, in many instances, uh, uh, proactive and intentionally uh, dishonest messaging that has gone out. As I have said in a response to the Right Honourable uh, Gentleman's initial uh, question, the passage of information to British nationals and others is incredibly difficult, um, and if it goes uh, if it goes wrong or if it's manipulated by bad faith actors, it could put British nationals and others in enhanced danger. Uh, I don't have an answer for her in the here and now, but she's absolutely right to raise it, and this is a classic example of why we have to be and why I would advise all people to be very, very careful and to check the provenance of information, particularly if they are about to make life and death decisions based upon it. Kevin Brown. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I get some real clarity now from the Foreign Secretary on this business of people who are not British nationals, but nevertheless, as in the case of my constituent, have been working for Public Health Wales for the last two years, live in my constituency, went to Sudan to celebrate Eid with their family and are now trapped there. And are being told, as I understand it, that they will not get help from the British government to return to their home and their workplace in my constituency. Now, is that the Foreign Secretary's policy? And if that is his policy, can he change it forthwith? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the eligibility criteria have been a part of our travel advice throughout this situation. I completely understand. I completely understand the point he's making. However, I would make the point, as I said in response to uh, another question from an honourable member, that uh, we cannot just expand the eligibility criteria for the uh, instances that have been brought forward uh, by honourable and right honourable members in the House. To do so, to do so, could substantially, unsustainably increase the number of people who we've given implicit. Uh, 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 an, an, an implicit implication that we could uh, evacuate them. I've said the window is limited. The ability to evacuate beyond that uh, is uh, completely unpredictable, and we have a duty to ensure that we do everything we can to evacuate British nationals and the dependents as per the criteria that has been already published. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have all of us watched the descent into civil war of Sudan with horror, but for the Sudanese diaspora in Britain and British nationals in Sudan, this is a time of immense trauma and suffering, and we cause the trauma and suffering of the evacuation of Kabul. A different situation, but the casework that I am seeing and that we are hearing today is very, 
familiar. So will the Secretary of State confirm, visas are not his responsibility, he tells us, but he confirm that he's working with the Home Office as a matter of urgency to put in place a consistent and humane approach to those who do not have the requisite travel documentation that includes babies born recently, spouses in, in the process applying for visas, and as we've heard, you know, uh, people living here who are on holiday in Su Sudan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, it is inevitable, inevitable that comparisons will be made between this operation and the evacuation from Kabul, but they are fundamentally different. Um, the, uh, the operation that we have uh, conducted, uh, both the uh, initial military operation to evacuate our diplomatic staff and those of uh, other nations, and then the ongoing uh, airlift of British nationals and their dependents from Wadi Sidna is fundamentally different to the situation in Kabul. As I say, I'm very proud of the fact that we are one of the three framework nations who have uh, facilitated the operation from Wadi Sidna, which has allowed French, German, British and others to airlift people out. We will, of course, always make sure that we protect uh, the vulnerable where we can, and I have said that in my statement. That is reflected in the travel advice. Ultimately, our duty is uh, towards British nationals and their dependents, and we have, of course, facilitated the evacuation of Sudanese nationals who are dependents of British nationals. Jim Shannon. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, can I also thank the Secretary of State very much for his determination and his leadership at a time whenever we, we look to the, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for that leadership. And 512 people uh, have died, thousands have been injured since the power struggle began two weeks ago. The Foreign Secretary has urged all UK nationals to leave before the ceasefire ends at 12 uh, o'clock tonight. Uh, I understand, and the Secretary of State can, of course, can confirm this, that there is still uh, um, a number of UK nationals could be left behind due to poor mobile phone contact, due to embassy staff not being available. Not their fault, by the way. It's just about contact for people. So, I, and I believe we have a duty to each and every one to ensure protection. I know the Secretary of State also believes that. So, will the Secretary of State do what? Will the Secretary of State do to protect those UK nationals who were not fortunate enough? to get out in time. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the airhead at Wadi Sidna is uh, one of our preferred options. That's why we made the uh, commitment to be one of the three framework nations who have facilitated the use of that air, uh, that air base. He is absolutely right to identify it. It is very, very difficult for us to make any kind of commitment uh, beyond the ceasefire. Uh, one of the best things we can do to protect British nationals in Sudan is to try and make sure this ceasefire continues and we work incredibly hard both directly and, uh, and with partners and with uh, regional um, power bases to, uh, to, to, to facilitate that, to try and bring a lasting peace. There will, uh, even if the airhead is no longer operational, there will be other routes out and as I say our presence at the borders and at Port Sudan will be to facilitate that and we will keep communicating best advice in terms of evacuation options and keep safe options through all the channels notwithstanding the point that I've made earlier that communication remains incredibly difficult. Finally, Kirsten Oswald. Mr yeah, Deputy yeah. Speaker, um, I, I've been reading reports about two NHS doctors who've been denied passage on planes evacuating from Sudan and that struck me because my constituents who are NHS doctors themselves are in Sudan with their young children and I'm very keen to hear what the plan is in relation to NHS doctors. I don't believe for one minute that the general public would expect that they will be abandoned by this government to their peril in Sudan. And how many children who are British nationals are in Sudan and are not yet on one of these planes? And what is the Foreign Secretary going to do to maintain proper food and water supplies for them? And how does he plan to get these children home? Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said in response to the uh, right honourable gentleman's uh, initial question, it is not possible for the UK or indeed any other country in the world to know exactly how many British nationals are in uh, Sudan or indeed any other country. We do not demand British nationals register with the government when they are uh, overseas. We have put out a register your presence 
which has uh, which uh, gives us some idea but that, but it, no one no one in the world no country, sorry no government in the world uh, can say with certainty and, and indeed people that have registered on that registered register your presence website may well have already left so that is the explanation of why no one can give a complete figure as to who, who is available. We have pumped out messages across a wide range of channels, letting people know that the airhead exists, and we have called them forward to do so. Um, and we will make sure that uh, British national children and, of course, uh, uh, dependents of British nationals are airlifted out. And as I've said, even if we are not able to maintain that airlift capability from Wally Sidna. We do have a presence at the borders, we have a presence in Saudi Arabia, and we have a presence in Port Sudan. Can I thank the Foreign Secretary and the Opposition Front Bench for their presence? And anybody wishing to leave the chamber, please do so quietly. Point of order, Mr. Shannon. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I did ask the Speaker's Office this morning for a clarity in this matter, and it, it probably comes off the back of, of, of the voter ID question this morning and, and electoral fraud. Mr. Uh, when, it, when nominations closed for the Northern Ireland local government election, I became aware that a man listed as one of the proposers of Jared McGee in Ballyclare was the victim of identity fraud by Sinn Féin. The victim met uh, the CEO of Antrim Council and established that his identity had been stolen. He was suddenly listed as a proposer on the nomination papers of Sinn Féin's Jared McGee. Pur uh, purportedly, this includes the act of forging the signature of the victim on official nomination papers. For clarity, the victim does not know Jared McGee and did not sign his nomination papers. The problem occurs, Mr Deputy Speaker, because this matter cannot be investigated until the election is over. So can you, Mr Deputy Speaker, advise me on how I can best stand up for democracy in this case in advance of polling day, as it can't be answered before then. Thank you. I thank the honourable gentleman for informing the chair that he wished to raise this matter as a point of order, but as he's fully aware, it is not, in fact, a matter for the chair. Uh, more importantly, given that the actions that he described are potentially criminal, I think that it would be inappropriate for me or indeed anybody else in the chair to seek to preempt or interfere with what might become a judicial inquiry. I'm afraid I can't help the honourable gentleman further. Presentation of bill. Secretary Secretary Sick. Mr Heaton Harris. Northern Ireland Interim Arrangements Bill. Second reading what day? Now. We now come to the debate on uh, progress on reform of NHS dentistry. Judith Cummings to move. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I beg to move that this House has considered the matter of progress on reforms to NHS dentistry. I also thank the Backbench Business Committee for once again granting this important debate and to my co-sponsor, the Honourable Member for Waveney, for all his work in helping to secure this. And in preparing for this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thought it was useful to consider and reflect on the foundations of our NHS in the Beveridge Report, which was published 80 years ago last November. Though it would be an understatement to suggest that the world has changed since its publication, the identity of this country is still proudly centred around our National Health Service, an idea so powerfully contained within the pages of this report. For the great British social reformers of the 20th century, dentistry was not some Cinderella service of secondary importance. Beveridge himself concluded that no one could seriously doubt that a free dental service should become as universal as a free medical service. Eighty years after its publication, it is time that this House reaffirmed our commitment to universal yeah. dental care yeah. in this country. It is worth noting that the Beveridge Report and its proposition for universal access to NHS dentistry was published by a multi-party coalition government. And as I stand here today, both sides of the chamber will agree that the crisis in NHS dentistry deserves the same cross-party attention that it was afforded 80 years ago, because the system has decayed, access has fallen to, fallen to an historic low, and inaction over the past 13 years has caused untold damage. 
There can no longer be any more of half measures or excuses, because now it is time to establish a new preventative dental contract fit for the 21st century. My words over my campaigning over the last eight years now serve as a compendium of forecasting doom, because in 2016 I warned of a mounting crisis and drew the government's attention to a digital report warning that half of dentists were thinking of leaving the profession. And between 2017 and 2019, I warned of 60% of dentists planning to leave NHS dentistry. And in 2020, after years of repeated warnings, I once again informed the government that of those remaining, that 58% of the UK's dentists were planning on moving away from NHS dentistry within five years. The government once again fudged and ignored, and over 1,000 dentists left the NHS. This NHS dental crisis has been a devastating slow motion car crash of the government's own making. And yet, year after year, minister after minister, they have assured me of their commitment to reform. Last year, when I pressed the Health Minister for action on this matter, she informed me that she had started work on a dental contract reform. But just yesterday, we became aware that after 13 years in power, the government is starting once again with an announcement of a plan to publish a new plan to improve access to NHS dentistry. A plan for a plan. We would all welcome further clarification about what this plan might involve. I can only, only hope that with mine and other members' sustained campaigning on this issue, that this plan could result in some positive change for my constituents in Bradford South. Ex I certainly will. Thank the Honourable Member for giving way and congratulate her on this excellent and incredibly important debate. Would she agree with me that, as we see in Newcastle, where NHS dentistry access has become almost impossible for so many of my constituents, there is also growing up a whole generation of young people and children who have never had access to an NHS dentist, and that is absolutely storing up, or causing immense suffering now, and storing up not only pain and suffering, but also additional cost for the future. My honourable friend makes a very, very important, um, important point, and I've got to say I cover access specifically to NHS dentistry for children later on in my remarks, because experience would suggest that this, um, in, in terms of the positive change for my constituents, in terms of the government's plan for a plan, that this may well be wishful thinking, because my constituents are suffering, and they take no solace whatsoever from the government's commitment to plan for a plan for reform. The contract has been in place since 2006 and the government has been undertaking a review of the process since 2011, 12 years of working on it and it's still a work in progress. I certainly will. In that way, the British Dental Association has shown that over half of dentists have reduced their NHS work um, since the start of the pandemic. Official workforce data counts people not how much NHS work versus pri private work they do. Does she agree that it is important that the government actually collects this data? Thank you, and I, I thank you, for the Honourable Member, for her um, important remarks. And I absolutely agree with her. Um, collection of data is paramount in solving this issue. Uh, because I've got to say, this dodging of responsibility over 12, for over, over 12 years is just nothing short of a disgrace because now we all bear witness to the consequences of this crisis and they are human consequences. The victim of government negligence are, as they almost have been, the most vulnerable people in our society. And in Bradford, 98% of dentists are now closed to NHS patients. And as I informed the Prime Minister just last month, 80% of practices are now refusing to accept new children as NHS, new, uh, accepting children as new NHS patients. The lack of access is having crushing consequences. In the financial year of 2021-2022, 42,000 episodes of NHS hospital tooth extractions were carried out for 0 to 19 year olds. This is an 83% rise on the previous financial year. And a dental nurse has previously and recently spoken of routinely extracting up to 10 teeth from a single child. That is children routinely losing half of their teeth. And this dental crisis is now ultimately a crisis of inequality. The rate of tooth extraction is more than three, three times higher in Yorkshire and the Humber than in the southeast of England. And children living in our country's most deprived communities face an extraction rate 
three and a half times greater than those living in the most affluent areas. Children let down by the system. In care homes for the elderly, the access crisis has been just as devastating, whereas in 2019, 6% of care homes were reporting that they were unable to access NHS dental care services. This has risen more than four times to 25% in 2022. That's a quarter of all care homes. And as this Conservative government continues to mull over minor reforms, it fails entire generations of people who deserve a reasonable standard of care. No more cradle to the grave principles of the NHS. But a 21st century Britain requires a 21st century approach. We need more than mere revision of the contract. And my right honourable friend, the leader of the opposition, has spoken of the need for a new healthcare system, which is as just much about prevention as it is about cure. It is a concrete fact that no dental treatment is stronger than protecting a healthy and original tooth. But in 2021 to 2022, tooth decay was again the most common reason for hospital admission for children between six and 10 years old. For 0 to 19 year olds, hospital tooth extractions cost our NHS a shocking £81 million a year. In 2022, instead of children visiting the dentist on a regular basis, it costs our NHS an average of more than £700 for a single minor extraction of a child's tooth in hospital. We are paying for the costly catch-up with our failure to prevent tooth decay. And so prevention should be at the heart of our government's agenda for dental reform. We owe this to the generations of people currently being let down by the system. This country once had a strong school dental service. With the current shocking rates of tooth decay amongst children, now is the time to resurrect this policy as an interim prevention matter. It's not only the right thing to do, it's a sensible option for this country's finances. And care homes would benefit from a dental contract which commissions stronger community dental services. And this used to happen by using integrated care systems, upskilling care workers, and further involving local authorities, access can be increased. The pressure on dental services can be reduced. Prevention really is better than the cure. We have a duty to ensure that taxpayers' money is spent effectively in areas right across this country. A decade of savage cuts by the Tory government has left long-term damage. It is estimated that £880 million a year is now required just to restore to 2010 levels of resources. There will be no escape in the, needing, the need for more investment, but it must be thoughtful investment. One answer could be the introduction of a prevention-focused capitation-type system, where lump sums are provided to NHS dental teams to treat sections of the population. Successful targeted investment is possible, and in 2017, I developed a project in Bradford with the former Minister for Health, and I thank the Honourable Member for Winchester, who is now Chair of the Health Select Committee and who is in his place, for his work with me on this pilot scheme, which invested over £250,000 of unused clawback over three years into my own constituency of Bradford South. This went straight back into local services and ensured that patients were able to access roughly 3,000 new NHS dental appointments in an area of high dental deprivation, targeting extra resources straight into an area where it was needed. Although this was never meant to be a long-term solution, it proved that targeted investment is possible. Where there's a will, there's a way. With a staggering 10% of this year's £3 billion national budget for NHS dentistry set to be returned, the system is clearly broken. Taxpayer money is returned not because people aren't desperate for NHS dentists, but because this government continues to push an underfunded and unworkable, unworkable system. It lacks the will to act and a will to find a way forward to protect dental health in this country. Because now is the time to put national back into NHS dentistry. Yeah, yeah. The government may, may once again list mm. the challenges that stand in the way of re-establishing a truly universal dental care system. We are in a time of extraordinary, extraordinary change, with unprecedented cost of living crises, 
war on the European continent and a society impacted by a deadly virus. Our health system is undoubtedly challenged, but 80 years ago, a Conservative Labour coalition government published a guiding principle of NHS dental reform, just as this country fought for its very freedom and independence. In Sir William Beveridge's own words, a revolutionary moment in the world's history is time for revolutions, not for patching. It is time for real change, not empty promises. This is a time for a government dedicated to acting in the public good, to revitalise and resurrect NHS dentistry once again, ending the shoddy record of this government's patching of our NHS dental services. Yeah. Question is, as on the order paper, Chairman of the Select Committee, Steve Bryan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the opening speech from the Honourable Lady from Bradford South, who's brought back many happy memories of our time together when I was indeed the Public Health Minister, and uh, she's been very consistent on this issue over many years. Today's debate, very timely, Mr. Deputy Speaker, comes the week when the Health and Social Care Select Committee, which you rightly say I, I, I'm privileged to chair, held a crucial oral evidence session with the Minister who is in his place on the front bench. Dentistry is a subject very close to my heart, uh, from my time serving as Public Health Minister in the Department and also one of our top priorities as a Select Committee. We launched our inquiry into the subject shortly after I became Chair in November just last year. We're looking at what steps the Government and NHS England should be taking to improve access to NHS dental services and that further reform to that NHS dental contract. Rarely, I would say, has an inquiry been more needed or welcome. It's clear that there are huge problems facing NHS dentistry, and I'm sure every colleague in the chamber today and not will be familiar with stories of constituents having trouble accessing NHS dentistry, and I'm no exception to that, uh, both as a constituency MP and indeed my family and I as a patient. One of the submissions, many submissions we received, talked about people extracting their own teeth uh, with pliers, uh, something that should not be possible in the 21st century. The problem is obviously particularly acute in some areas of the country, we'll hear talk today about uh, dental deserts I'm sure, and among some groups of people, but challenges and capacity issues are being experienced across the board. Our inquiry received a wide range of written evidence, including from nearly 30 local health watch groups, we also held two detailed oral evidence sessions examining both the problem and of course the potential solutions. We've heard from Healthwatch that the majority of complaints they receive at the moment are about dentistry. Day in, day out, local health watch groups are receiving emails and calls about problems accessing an NHS dentist. And this is also reflected in the evidence we received. I know it's not easy for some to hear this, but I can only follow the evidence that I receive as a select committee chair. We've also heard again and again about the challenge of recruiting and retaining NHS dentists. Now the government have, I'm pleased to say, started to act and pick up on some of the previous uh, tinkering reforms, for which I take uh, some, some of the credit and also some of the responsibility that I didn't fundamentally reform the dental contract either during my time as dental minister. Now in July last year, the government announced several changes to that 2006 dental contract including a change to the way units of dental activity, or UDAs, are awarded and advising longer recall periods for adults with good oral health in line with those nice guidelines. In our first evidence session, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we heard from Sean Charwood from the British Dental Association, who told us that these reforms, the dental contract, represent tweaks rather than the fundamental reform that is needed. He said, and I quote, in essence, what we are doing at the moment is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while the service slowly slips into the sea. To be fair to the Minister, who I have a lot of respect for and, and spoke really well at our Select Committee earlier this week, I was delighted to hear him acknowledge to that session that he does want, his words, quite fundamental reform to the dental contract. That has to be right. He argued that the existing reforms were welcome, but noted that they were only a start. I think that's very good to hear, and it was well covered on the media on Tuesday evening. I do worry, though, that even if significant reforms to the NHS dental contract were made tomorrow, it will be too late or an extreme challenge to bring back those dentists who've already left the NHS dental workforce. 
it's really hard for people to make that decision. They came into dentistry to work in, in public service and I feel once they've made it, it's final for them and it's gonna be very difficult to get them to change their mind. Perhaps the minister, a subject that I touched on with him earlier in the week, could tell us a bit more about what he's gonna to do to address that uh, return issue. In our session, I asked him about his ambition for NHS dentistry. Tony Blair famously, 1999 conference speech, said that his ambition was for everybody to have access to an NHS dentist within two years. It never happened, but it was a clear ambition. I give him credit for that. Now, the minister said the number one thing on his mind was improving access for those who don't currently have access to a dentist. Quite right. But when I pressed him on whether that meant everyone would have access to an NHS dentist, he said that he wanted everyone who needs an NHS dentist to be able to access one. I think this is welcome. It's a repeat of that ambition. And I think it's good that the, the government have that ambition. Obviously, delivering it and when is the key. And I would ask him to expand on that today when he sums up. He also talked about making NHS dentistry, Mr. Deputy Speaker, more attractive to dentists, <laughs> which is clearly crucial. So I know that the minister said that the problem is not a shortage of dentists per se, it's a shortage of dentists who are undertaking NHS dentistry. And the figures certainly do bear that out. Our